હલો ઓડિયો આવે ત્યાં તારા પાસે ઓનલાઈન ચેક કર ડિસ્ટર્બન્સ છે અહીંયા હેલો હેલો માઇક ચેક માઇક ચેક હેલો હેલો નીરવ કેમેરા ચાલુ આયા હા હા એ આવશે આવશે જતું રહેશે ઓનલાઈન અવાજ ચેક કર ચેક 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 નીરવ નીચેનો હોલ બાકી છે જો ચેક 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 હેલો માઇક ટેસ્ટ વન ટુ થ્રી વન ટુ થ્રી માઇક ટેસ્ટ હેલો હેલો બરાબર હેલો હેલો માઇક ટેસ્ટિંગ હેલો હેલો રાઈટ ના રાઈટ ના હેલો હેલો માઇક ટેસ્ટિંગ
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the post-lunch session. And we have session on technology, uh, that is CGM and AGP workshop. And uh, we have two pioneers of technology in India, CGM and uh, AGP, Dr. Bansi Sabu and Dr. Manoj Chawla. Uh, we'll introduce Dr. Bansi Sabu as such. He doesn't need any introduction. And uh, he's the chief diabetologist and chairman in diabetes care and hormone clinic at Ahmedabad. He was the past president of RSSDI. He is the honorary secretary of Diabetes India. And he'll be today taking a topic, whether we are migrating from SMBG to CGM. And it's a very interesting topic because uh, CGM gives a whole lot of perspective regarding the retrospective data of time in range and which can uh, help us decide the treatment part and the last three months profile. Whereas SMBG gives us the diabetes blood sugar level at that point of time and it, the frequency depends on the patient or how many times he is going to do. So sir, over to you, Dr. Bansi Sabu. Thanks the scientific chair and thank you chairperson for this workshop. We know that there will be few persons in the workshop, but workshop is made for few persons only to understand it better. That's what we thought of that workshop should be. And the second is wherever you are doing the convention, you have to see how many number of holes are there and accordingly you have to justify the place where we should keep the workshop. So. And less than number, you don't worry, we can he still have a better discussion. That's not necessarily that you should have hundreds of people to listen only. Now, the topic is uh, very interesting, which we had capped. It is, are we migrating from self-monitoring of blood glucose to continuous glucose monitoring? And this is a change which we are seeing in 2020. I'm sure before 2025 20, years, in 1995, when we had a data from UKPDS and DCCT, uh, we were, you know, as a student, I was just passed out from MBBS and MD days and we were not able to understand that how one can do three or four times a sugar because that what it was done in DCCT trial and they could achieve a tight glycemic control. At that point of time, even the glucose meter was not available to our public hospital. Uh, in, in the hospital, it was not there rather uh, to buy for a patient, which was real difficult for that point of time. And at the same time, there was a, also people were not doing the A1C so often. I mean, A1C was considered only for some of the patients. And, and we used to titrate the dose by just checking the patient fasting blood glucose level or postprandial blood glucose level, which used to come from the lab. This is what I have seen. I'm sure Dr. Tripathi may share his view also that before 50 years or 40 years, how we were treating diabetes. Urine was the only parameter. So, I mean, today we, we all get surprised that, you know, it is how we were managing. I mean, today if you ask someone that only by checking patient one blood sugar of a fasting on one postprandial blood glucose level and you are just changing his therapy, you are just titrating the dose of patients pre-meal or post-meal type of glucose level, it, is it possible? You will feel that, no, it is not possible. So, the similarly... From SMBG, we are migrating from self-monitoring of blood glucose to continuous glucose monitoring. We all know that managing diabetes is not easy. It's really difficult. There are a lot of challenges when we are talking of managing diabetes, and particularly when we talk of type 1 diabetes. Patients who are almost like on insulin, type 2 diabetic, long duration of diabetes, the patients who is having risk of hypoglycemia, patient of chronic renal failure. So there is a lot of difficulties about the food. Food is, you just can't have every day the same type of food. Even for a uh, type 1 diabetes, I don't know how many of you are writing, but I write for type 1 diabetes a weekdays and weekends prescription separately because they may have different type of food also, all these things. There are medication which are also responsible for their sugar to go here and there and that's the reason every time that they have to check ideally a type 1 diabetic patient and that is what we recommend that they should check pre-meal blood glucose level every time they should count how much carbohydrate they are going to eat and they should use the insulin carb ratio and correction dose both for taking care of the next meal. And it's a 
continuous 365 24 by 7 procedure and that continue lifelong there is nothing like that they can change and this is the what the change is going to happen from self monitoring of blood glucose to the continuous glucose monitoring it is the activity which is also very important rather there is a separate workshop which we have done with a adjusting the insulin pump or adjusting the dose of insulin or adjusting the blood glucose monitoring along with the physical activity now you have a type 1 diabetic patient who might be doing marathon running or you have a type 1 who is doing a intensive physical exercise in the gym and they all require also the glucose monitoring more frequently and they require adjustment in their insulin doses as well as in other oral anti diabetic agents accordingly there are some biological reason also too little sleep jet lag and many more things are there environmental factors could be there i mean the expired insulin and something like that and it is the behavior and decision these are the multiple reasons for diabetes uh, to manage i mean not to have very good control in a person with diabetes now 20 years ago this paper is by roger maze I was there with Roger Maze exactly in 2005 in his center only and uh, it was a, a five days program and we were there and at that point of time three days he had put all the students who were come from all across the world uh, put the continuous glucose monitoring. So I remember my first CGM which was installed and I had seen it was in 2005 only and he has written one paper that 20 years ago many physicians treating people with diabetes thought the use of home blood glucose monitoring of any sort was a waste of time and expense. Now this is I am talking in 2005 when he thought of and writing a paper it was 1985. Why I have used this paper now because still we think in 2022 also that in 2005 actually we were thinking that it is of no use to use self monitoring of blood glucose to use multiple times the major challenges is reliability of patient data the glucose monitor which they were using uh, how reliable it is whether uh, because many of our patients still continue to test us they they do the glucose meter with a glucose monitor and they again try in the blood sample also in the lab sometimes they put the venous blood also on it and multiple problems are there interpreting patients data large number of blood glucose results between the visits also and time constraints in a busy medical practice and this is very important which i had seen a patient comes with a hundreds of blood glucose report to you he may show you in last three months some hundred reports on a, a piece of paper and actually a busy clinician is so much busy that he does not have a time to look into it and that also demotivate the patient for doing self-monitoring of blood glucose too. The Einstein research developed a series of standardized graphical presentation. Goal was to help physician quickly recognize a glucose pattern and trends. And actually, the uh, uh, Roger Maze has worked on it that actually he had collected these hundreds of thousands of the reports and he tried to make in a graphical form. And since then, glucose monitoring technology has been significantly improved in terms of accuracy and data management. That is what he has done in the form of ambulatory glucose profile. Now, how to help patients to identify their bright stops, uh, bright spots and landmines and this is what before meals you have to do, after meals which you have to do, before bed one has to do and this is what we ask the patient at least seven times a day. That's not possible sometime other than in a randomized control trial but what we do is you can do every day three times a day. And in a weekends, you can do seven times or one weekend, at least on Saturday, on Sunday, you can do seven times. And in other weekday, you can do seven times and otherwise three times a day and you can adjust the dose. If hypo and hyperglycemia is suspected, then again, you have to monitor at that point of time. So it's not just six or seven times, it becomes eight, nine or ten times also. And checking in pair, I mean, that is what pairing, monitoring in a pairing when you are doing before breakfast, after breakfast, before exercise, after exercise. So something when we are doing with a pairing of that, that is also known as the pairing monitoring which we do for the self-monitoring of blood glucose. It gives you an accurate check on an average blood glucose level, but it misses the glycemic excursion across the dose. And this is very, very important. And I have a patient and many of you must have seen the patients after using the continuous glucose monitoring. And this graph which I give you, there is one of our patients, suppose he is monitoring four times a day and that is what recommended. I mean in DCCT what they had asked that you do three times a day, you do four times if patient is having hypo and hyperglycemia, you do seven times a day on one particular day or eight times a day and this patient was actually doing, you can see here one, two, three or four. The same patient when you put on a continuous glucose monitoring, 
things are completely different. You are thinking that all four reports of this patient was absolutely normal. As per the, it is always uh, between 90 to 120 before meals and post meal. Also, it was fine, 140 or 150. But if you are doing continuous glucose monitoring, you will find that, you know, there are some hyperglycemic peak and there are some hypoglycemia too. Here you can see there is a hypoglycemia, there you can see hyperglycemia and that is what inter, uh, you know, whatever the number of times person is checking the sugar, in between there is a hypo and hyperglycemia peak. So I always tell the self-monitoring blood glucose is like a still photo and a continuous glucose monitoring is like a, a videography of it. Like self-monitoring will tell at this point of time, if I take a photograph of this, I can show that there are 40% sitting or 20% sitting in this room. That's one time, but after five minutes, you all may go away. And it, it can only show with the continuous glucose monitoring only by videography, whether they all 20 were awake in this meeting post lunch, whether they were all listening it, this all you can know by continuous glucose monitoring or by continuous videography. You just can't get with a one single still photograph which we do with the self-monitoring of blood glucose level. CGMS prim principle, I will not talk much. It is an interstitial fluid glucose level. It is not, I mean, new thing in our country. We are using since last almost 15 years, as I told you, continuous glucose monitoring. In our India, it was available and most of us you have used it. But current glucose monitoring devices have minimally invasive enzyme coated electrodes. So I, continuously evolution had happened. It used to be only for three days, then five days, seven days. And now we have even 14 days continuous glucose monitoring device which is available to us. As I told you, CGM capture after meal spikes and it gives you the trends of glucose and that is what is required. Why you need the trend? You just don't need only some glucose value to adjust the dose because we don't want our patient to go in hypo and we don't want our patient to go hyperglycemia. I will talk little on time in range. That concept had come after we started doing the continuous glucose monitoring for our patients. So one is raising the doubt and other is demystifying. The blood glucose monitoring still leaves the question, I am at 160. Am I going to go up or down? We don't know because at 160, whether patient should be happy or patient should be unhappy, we don't know whether after two hours of a food, if he thinks 160 is fine, but we don't know how much fat he had consumed. We don't know whether his peak will be coming after three hours or not. We don't know how much complex carbohydrate he has taken and what will be the peak of this person. We don't know any idea. And suppose patient has taken more amount of the insulin, probably he may have at 160 at two hours may be normal, but maybe at three hours or four hours he may go in down. That may be at 60 or 55 also. You don't know. You don't know what type of insulin he has taken. If he has taken a regular insulin, which may lead to hypoglycemia after four hours. He may have a patient of a gastroparesis where the peak may come after three or four hours also. And these all things you just cannot pick up by a single report of a 160 milligram. If I am going up or down, I am confused. It is the continuous glucose monitoring can tell me that whether I am going down, whether I am going fast, I mean down also, how fast I am going down, that's also very important. So it's a continuous glucose monitoring can provide the answer and more complete picture to allow the patients to make the best decision about their diabetes management. And when we teach the patient, when we try to educate the patient, when we want to empower the patient, that you know, you have to take care of your diabetic uh, management. This is the patient who is taking care of his diabetes for 365 days. He can't meet you multiple times. He cannot afford to meet you. Rather, he can meet you once in three months to diabetologist, endocrinologist, maybe once in a year. He might be meeting his primary care physician maybe once in two months or three months. He can't afford to meet you multiple times. We have to empower the patient. And for that, these type of devices are required for him to monitor himself and him to adjust his doses also. There are type of continuous glucose monitoring. We have retrospective that is professional one and we have real time and we have personal that is flash glucose monitoring. I'm sure we have used both type of glucose monitoring system in our country. We have a professional one where the monitor is on by the clinician. So patient has to put the sensor and patient has to come back to the doctor's clinic to get the data and you get the retrospective data. There are advantages of retrospective data. There are disadvantages of the retrospective data also. It is for 7 to 14 days. You can download all the reports. There is no alarm. Retrospective review of the patient. You have to understand that well, last 7 days what you have done, last 14 days what you have done. And the personal is owned by the patient. Patient monitor himself. You can come inside please. 
the patient can monitor himself they can uh, see the value by themselves uh, there are alarms for up and down and some require some calibration also so some of the glucose monitoring system require the uh, uh, calibration also and they can be interfaced with the smart device and that is what uh, the types of continuous glucose monitoring which are available to us as i told you the prestel one the guardian connect which is available to us we also have the dexcom and now new latest which is available to us with sarka cgm it's a continuous glucose monitoring device by uh, sarka the aris we also have the intermittent scan which is flash glucose monitoring by abbot again it is available in two form which is libre pro and libre so we have both again the professional one and we have uh, the one which is owned by the patients himself also the real time is better than intermittently scan cgm now these all three have their own advantage and own disadvantage now if you talk about the internationally the western population when you can educate the patient so much so that patient can have the real time continuous glucose monitoring and simultaneously he can act also on that suppose you are not confident that my patient if he is going to have the 90 sugar middle of the day what he is going to do because you have to tell the patient that if your sugar comes 252 what he has to do and when your sugar comes 92 what he has to do so somebody who is on a real time continuous glucose monitoring you have to empower the patient so much so you have to educate the patient so much so that he should know what to do with that sugar report if you are not confident then you use the professional one for some days and you get the report and you try to teach and educate the patient see your last 14 days report shows this and this then you have a flash glucose monitoring when every time you have to do the flashing in compared to flash you have a now continuous glucose monitoring which is better because you can see in your mobile the way you are seeing that what is the temperature of goa just now you can see or what is the time the similar way you can see your glucose reading also but you have to educate the patient for the same because you should know the patient should also act for the report he should not come after 14 or 15 days or after 2 months that my all reports were about 250 even i am using continuous glucose monitoring what's the point of using that cgm machine if somebody is keeping the sugar more than 250 in last all the day or last 3 days 7 days 10 days so you have to empower you have to educate the patient this is one of the paper which is talking that in a 6 month measure if patient using real time in compared to intermittently scan now if i am telling something that real time is better than intermittently scan somebody may say that where the evidence is yes here is the evidence you can see that a 59.6% time the person will be in time in range in compared to a person who is using intermittently scanned continuous glucose monitoring the a1c difference between both the group will be 7.4 versus 7.1 but the most important thing is the severe hypoglycemia and you can see the person who is using real time continuous glucose monitoring the risk of hypoglycemia is only 0.47% in compared to the person who is using intermittently scanned is almost 84% uh, uh, 80.84% for the severe hypoglycemia this is the continuous glucose monitoring recommendation by american diabetic association in 2022 so i we have started talking about 2005 and now we are talking in 2022 what american diabetic association is talking about it we know that we all follow eda we all follow the international guideline and we also have the our indian guidelines and where again in this year when we are going to have in 2023 our guideline we will be also having the statement on a continuous glucose monitoring it is a 14 day continuous glucose monitoring monitoring assessing for time in range the glucose uh, management indicator is recommended for glucose management so it's no more only a1c i'm not saying that you throw a1c self monitoring blood glucose level a1c and continuous glucose monitoring probably i can say they all three are complementary to each other but 14 day cgm is recommended by american diabetic association for a good glucose management cgm recommended for all adults who take insulin mainly who are on basal only even on the basal bolus they are talking of our type 2 diabetic patients because those patients who are on insulin and in india we are many of our patients on sulfonylurea which can increase the risk of hypoglycemia as insulin there is a automated insulin delivery device which is available in india also with continuous glucose monitoring is recommended for children with diabetes those who are type 1 
it is recommended that they should use the CGM along with AID, which is automated insulin delivery system. That is what is recommended by American Diabetes Association. And when used in setting of clinical trial or when clinical circumstances such as during a shortage of personal protective equipment required, CGM can be used to manage hospitalized patient also. So somebody who is in hospital, who is not in ICU, who can be also monitored continuously with continuous glucose monitoring. And that's the real advantage because the patient who is in the hospital, we are, otherwise we have to get his sugar multiple times and that you know you can save his multiple prick by using a continuous glucose monitoring. Those patients who are not very sick and those patients who are not in ICU, they can be used with this. The ACE also recommend the same. So, I mean, American Association of Clinical Endocrinology in a different language, they are also talking that continuous glucose monitoring is recommended not only for type 1, for type 2 diabetic patients also and to decrease the risk of hypoglycemia for patients who are on insulin or sulfonylurea, but not only for that, but also for empowering, for educating, for motivating the patients, for even changing the therapy also, a continuous glucose monitoring is really very much required for those patients. The significance of CGM in patients with diabetes, discover previously unknown hypo and hypoglycemic events, useful in trend arrows, that is very important, value of metrics such as glycemic variability, time span, that is time in range below uh, a targeted glucose level, time above range and time in range, to know all those things, determine the effect of glucose lowering therapy, to know that how much insulin is going to make the difference. Like we were talking about that one type of insulin when we compare with other, can we have a two comparison? If you don't do the continuous glucose monitoring, probably we can't do for that. Evaluate the effect of exercise on a glucose control, provide the behavioral intervention based on a real-time glucose value to individualize the management of the patient and analyze the glucose effect of targeted pharmacological intervention, whether fasting and post-meal glucose level both. In a clinical insight, I just give you uh, one or two examples that CGM when it was compared with blood glucose monitoring resulted in a significant lowering HbA1c level at 8 months. So we have evidence to show that why we should use the CGM over SMBG and this is the data which I am showing that there is a significant reduction not only for the HbA1c but also you can see the risk of hypoglycemia is also getting less. Even the benefit of CGM, many of clinicians, they feel that CGM is to be used only when patient is going for insulin pump or when somebody is going for an advancement in therapy. It's not like that. To understand many more things about the glycemic trend, about the glycemic variability, about to know about the hypoglycemia, I think continuous glucose monitoring is altogether separate. It is nothing to do with only with pump. And that's the reason in Diabetes India, this time we had kept a, a workshop, not combined with insulin pump or an advanced uh, uh, insulin delivery devices. It is a dedicated workshop only on continuous glucose monitoring to reduce that how much hb one reduction is there, 0.78%, 21-point milligram deciliter lowering the uh, average sensor reading and 11.2% 11 11 more in time in range with the patients who are on a continuous glucose monitoring along with multiple daily insulin injection. The real-time CGM user improve the time in range compared to SMBG user. Evidence of real-time CGM efficacy in type 1 and type 2. We also have the data for type 2 diabetic also patients and there I had shown you that evidence of real-time continuous glucose monitoring device in a benefiting for type 1 and type 2 both. Real-world use of this, there is a 308 young people with diabetes, 75% were using CGM while only 25% were using SMBG. The real-world study also support the use of continuous glucose monitoring in type 1 and type 2 diabetes independent of their treatment design, whatever the treatment which they are taking, still they had used. And to last slide, the take-home message, the self-monitoring of blood glucose measurement do not capture the post meal blood glucose spike while continuous glucose monitoring capture post meal spike and glycemic excursion across the day. CGM provide information about the glucose concentration as well as trend information about the direction and rate of changing glucose concentration. Guideline recommended the use of CGM in diabetes management. Numerous randomized control trial had demonstrated benefits from using real-time continuous glucose monitoring over SMBG, including lowering of A1C and reduced hypoglycemia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chairperson. And we will have discussion at the end that will be better. And we will show the device also. Thank you.
अरे सर थैंक यू बंसी सर आफ्टर दिस वेरी गुड लेक्चर आई थिंक नाउ इट इज टाइम फॉर डॉक्टर मनोज मनोज चावला इज गोइंग टू स्पीक अबाउट फोकस ऑन टाइम इन रेंज थ्रू सीजीएम टू टारगेट बेटर क्लिनिकल आउटकम इन डायबिटीज to introduce dr manoj chawla after doing diploma diabetes Sorry. from uh, nair hospital and mumbai university he has done fellowship in rsa di as well as aprcp from edinburgh he is director and consultant yes, diabetologist sir, sir. at lena diabetes care and uh, uh, diabetes center at mumbai he is also consultant diabetologist at reja okay, hospital sir, sir. ortis then uh, municipal general hospital andheri He is organizing secretary for Diabetes India Conference 2022. He is also honorary visiting faculty at uh, D.Y. Patil Medical Sciences, Navi Mumbai. He has also awarded RSSDI fellowship for the year 2017 and fellowship of the Royal College of Physicians of uh, Edinburgh for the year 2019. He is uh, principal investigator in various global MSC clinical trials for NCs and devices. He is member of the Technology Task Force for RSSDI National. He has uh, awarded, uh, or rather, he has done uh, papers in more than uh, 25 national and international journals. He is also associate editor of International Journal of Diabetes in Developing Countries. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Okay. So. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, first of all, I am extremely overwhelmed by the response, and Bansi and me have been talking about it. The technology and CGM workshops need not be in workshop halls, but they have to get to the main front, and, and which is what we have planned for all of you. We will have the DTEC Con conference next year, um, third week of March, which is going to go big and national. We had an online one, but we'll be doing an in-person, and probably it will be in Goa again, uh, third week of March, where we'll have the best of international and national faculty focusing on technology in the use of diabetes. So Banshi spoke to us about uh, the migration probably from SMBG to CGM. I'm going to be focusing on, on, on TIR. So as, as we understand, there are many phases of an A1C today, Though HbA1c is still the strongest um, endpoint metric that we have for long-term diabetes control, HbA1c doesn't give us the whole picture. There would be many individuals with the same A1c but completely different glucose profiles. So gone are the days that we can just sit back on an HbA1c and manage diabetes. It can be done in few patients but in many we would miss out the variability. And which is where the time in range which largely is derived from CGM comes into place. An AGP report today will carry the metrics of time in range. In fact today time in range is now becoming a part of most software reports of all CGM devices. Be it Metronic, be it the Abbott. Uh, I'm sure when uh, Eris gets its own uh, which we are going to do a demo today when they also come out their software will also incorporate the time in range in fact you can actually calculate time in range through smbg also it's just that for that time in range to have some accuracy you will need to have far more frequent smbg so at least a seven point preferably a nine point smbg and all of us realize that it's going to be difficult you may have a one motivated patient who may do it seven nine times but not too many who will manage to do that so time in range can be derived from there but doesn't happen in which is where CGM becomes the, the means of doing that. So this is the AGP report as we understand the median is the, is the line that you see there. And then you have the interdecile and the interquartile range. So the AGP report is basically to simplify that when you get CGM data, CGM data basically is the sugar movement over a 24 hour period. Each day line is going to be plotted, if you plot it between 12 a.m. to 12 a.m. over a 24 hour chart, you will see the sugar movement on each day. Now when you put superimpose these lines, if I am doing a CGM for 7 days or 14 days, each of these lines will get plotted on top of each other. So 
so in the past when we were using cgm these lines plotted over each other sometimes would be completely variable now when you do a cgm as a physician or when a patient sees that the idea is to understand their profile but in the past when we didn't have this software the cgm sometimes would still not help because you would see too many ups and downs so how do you make the changes and this is where the agp came in a lot of people think agp is another cgm it is a specific no agp which is ambulatory glucose profile is a software simplification of your cgm lines right so when you have these lines all over to compress that and to give us a report where we easily understand it is what is agp agp is a patented software by international diabetes center which they then uh, lease it out or they 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 rent it out to any of the software companies who want to buy it from them or who want to license it this agp is a percentile form so 50% of the readings which are at one point will give you the median which is the center black blue line the remaining between 10th percentile and 90th percentile the 80% of the readings would be the light blue shaded portion but all of you understand that when your patients do their sugars one or day somebody would have eaten one or day somebody would have exercised more so there will be an occasional high reading and an occasional low reading when those readings are very few those fall into the lower 10 percentile or the upper 10 percentile so we all understand percentage better percentile we do understand but we as doctors are not so programmed on the percentile but this is a percentile system so which is where it makes it easier that means we focus more on the median and then the the blue shaded portion the light blue shaded portion up and down is more related to patient's behavior which happens on one or day when the patient went wrong in terms of food or delayed the meal and on the lower strata had a hypoglycemia so when you look at the reports you will see individual day reports also so all of us have started asking for doing cgm some do it directly some you have companies who are offering just like the abpm they offer that they will do it for your patients we do have a couple of chairs ahead please make yourself comfortable and as bansi said those who want to use the carpet please be our guest we apologize that uh, it's packed uh, but you are overwhelming us with your presence so thank you so each day when you are doing those reports at least start spending some time with the patient on that report and understanding that report yourself as well so you are you will have the individual day readings now the time in range that is largely recommended for most people with type 2 and type 1 is between 70 and 180 in pregnancy it goes down to 63 and 140 and then you may also have relaxations that you may want in some patients and so you can set it in the software if you don't set it the standard would be 70 to 180 when you download the data on the software you have the means of changing that now if if i have a patient who is extremely determined and wants to try and touch closer to 6% hba1c we may probably keep a 70 to 140 for that individual as a range but the larger recommendation or unless you change it it is 70 to 180 so anything which is going to go below the preset range is going to come in red which signifies hypoglycemia and anything which is going to go above 180 is going to become yellow which is hyperglycemia of course there are recommendations today as to how much is acceptable within range largely 70% how much is acceptable above range because it's not that you won't go a person with diabetes will have food may have something it's not that every sugar will be below 180 he or she will touch up to 190 200 for a short duration and start coming down which is acceptable you cannot have 100% time in range if you are a person with diabetes very few will have that so a certain percentage which is 25 to 30 going above range is acceptable in the hypoglycemia it should be less than 5% less than 1% should be below 54 which would lead towards severe hypoglycemia having said that every time we'll hear an argument about is is this genuinely true so many times patients have seen the red and they have turned done an smbg but they found it to be 75 whereas the cgm is showing a 60 65 yes technology evolves is this 100% accurate no if today you do between your sugars between different glucose meters you will see some variability there if your patient goes to five laboratories on the same day you will see differences there as well so there is always going to be a difference 
10 to 15 percent mod value, right, which is mean amplitude of deviations, is what the FDA recommends. So less than 15 percent mod value, you get the FDA recognition. Of course, the newer sensors have now dropped it down to 8 percent, which means the variability is still there. There will be difference, but it is lesser. But having said that, if somebody sees an hypoglycemia and doesn't feel that, they may have to cross-check with an SMBG in some situations. And of course, it's also to do with day 1 and day 14 on most technologies. If you're using a 14-day technology, it takes a warm-up period and by 14-day, it may be wearing off. So take the day 1 and day 4. Now this being a workshop, I'm trying to give you some other tips which go beyond just the, the, uh, the, the, the the theory of uh, the entire CGM. That day one and day 14 take with a pinch of salt. Right? It may not be the most accurate data on day one and day 14. So again, this is about the questions that we wonder, why do we need monitoring tool beyond A1C? I think Bansi's told us that. Glycemic variability is the, and uh, when we talk about glycemic variability, you have the intra and interday variations. So what is intraday and what is interday? Let me go back to that CGM uh, AGP picture. When you have this AGP picture, somebody who's varying within a day, so this is a 24-hour picture, this whole thing is a 24-hour picture. Now within the 24-hour picture, sorry, yeah, within the 24-hour picture, this individual is, 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 is probably okay here in terms of the median, spiking after breakfast, coming down, spiking again after evening supper, right? Now this of course is not an AGP of an Indian diet. We don't have supper, supper, we have four meals a day or maybe more. So we'll see different peaks. But this is basically signifying the intraday variability. Within a day, this individual is varying up and down. We would love to see a flatter line with just smaller peaks around the meal time. But this individual is definitely having a lot of intraday variability. What is interday variability then? The interday variability comes from the width of the AGP report. So even if I ask you to not look at this shaded portion up and down, the extreme light blue one, and you are looking at just this shaded blue portion, what do we want it to be? We want it to be a thin, thinner line, uh, what I always call as a, a small, thinner snake. And we don't want it to be a python which is gobbling up food and become wider. So if this is wider, that means there is interday variability. So if I see an individual, let's say it's 6 a.m. At 6 a.m. this person's sugar is going from 65 on one day to closer to 160 on another day. That is interday variability. There will be some variability, but thinner the better. Look at this person at this point in time. Again, so this is more interday variability and then you are appreciating the intraday. So we want somebody who is not being too variable day to day and even within the day they shouldn't be too variable. That will be an ideal profile. So metrics for glycemic variability, Moon, allow me the freedom of rushing through the theory part so we can have some discussion. So you have had multiple metrics. Today it's coming back to coefficient of variation. Now this comes fresh from ATTD where Bansi and me were there a few weeks back that what is largely going to be considered as a metric for variability. Please understand because these terms are going to be coming up all the time. Glycemic variability, the ideal metric which is being used is coefficient of variation, especially for regulatory approvals by FDA and others. Time in range is a wonderful metric, but it will remain a clinical metric for us to treat patients. The FDA as of now has not accepted time in range as a regulatory metric. Right, Bansi? I think Bansi was there in that meeting and part of the committee. So this is the ATD consensus statement. Um, which, which talks about how do we reach that point uh, of what is the recommendation. For some of us to understand, you know, when, when, we, when we talk to our patients, the first time we spoke to them about HbA1c, somebody would have asked you, Ye sade sade taka kya hai? what is 7.5, 8% or 7%, what does it mean? Because our patients are used to numbers of 140, 160, 180. So we had to tell them that 7% means close to 150, 154 ka average over the last three months. If you maintain that, you will get closer to 7%. So you have to educate them. How will they know why, what is 7%? Same way today, they know HbA1c now, but we are moving one step ahead. So how do they understand time and range? So we tell them that if you are going to be spending 70% of your time within the range, you will probably be closer to an HbA1c of 6.7 to 7%. And as you can appreciate here, 
for every 10% increase in time in range, the HbA1c will improve by about 0.7%. But having said that, these are approximate estimates based on certain models. So again, glycemic variability and risk of non-severe hypo, multiple. You know, sometimes people question that, really, you guys are talking about glycemic variability? Is there real, a genuine concern? Or you all are just creating this new metric of variability, just like the WhatsApp chats on, on LDL cholesterol levels and God knows what all entire diabetes is a scam. Glycemic variability is true. All of you, and I can see many seniors who've been treating diabetes for much, much, much longer than uh, you know, we've been uh, even born. Um, you would have always come across patients and thought, that this person always had 10% HbA1c, sab kuch kiya masti, but never landed up with any complication. And you had another uh, person who always said, who comes to you, who has nephropathy, has some retinopathy. Doctor, you've been treating me for last 10 to 15 years. My sugars were largely reasonably controlled, but why am I landing up with complication? Of course, there are many other factors. There are some going to be genetic preponderance, which we will learn in the future. But one of the possibilities always has been the variability leading to oxidative stress, leading to these complications. So some food for thought, glycemic variability is, is there and it creates problems. Implications have again been shown through many a trials. DEVOT was the cardiovascular outcome trial for, uh, for Degludec. And that again showed the link between glycemic variability, oxidative stress and the risk of complications. There is evidence also for time in range and microvascular complications. The way we talk about UK PDS, DCCT, 1% reduction means how much reduction in complication. There is evidence for time in range that improvement in time in range will reduce the complications by a certain percentage. Of course, this is not direct evidence. This is based on mathematical models extrapolated again from the DCCT uh, time era that they have had this model and displayed that. But there are many uh, studies now focusing on TR. And as I said, if not for regulatory purpose, for clinical treatment purpose, it has become a very useful tool, which is time in range. Also evidence for time in range and carotid intimal media thickness. So talking about not only microvascular, but possible connection with macrovascular complication. Now that's a different thought today that people are actually questioning macrovascular complication. This is not related to the topic, but I thought I'll bring it up. Researchers world over are questioning that is cardiac disease a macrovascular complication. They are now showing evidence that diabetes is affecting the microvasculature even in the cardiac and the carotid systems or, or the cardiovascular systems much before it becomes a macrovascular disease. So everything that we have been thinking about as a large vessel disease may actually be starting more as a small vessel disease. There's a lot of work going on and you'll hear more of this interesting data and research in the years to come. So there continues to be an association between derived time in range and the major adverse cardiovascular events, which is MACE that we see in all cardiovascular outcome trials. Again, data for 10-year evidence. These are thoughts from uh, as to, again, the derivation from, from, from the DCCT UK PDS studies. Hypoglycemia, extremely important factor why we want to do CGM and start looking at, at, at uh, time in range. And glycemic variability is definitely becoming a clinical target for all of us. Yes, we can all sit back and say, we are in limited resource, patient cannot afford. Well, when you are in limited resource, you, may do, you don't even do HbA1c. So you, you, you manage with not even SMBG, but patient doing one fasting or fasting and post lunch in three months and coming to you with one laboratory report, which is what used to happen in the past and you were managing. But today, when you learn better, you do start asking for other metrics because you know you're missing the point in many a patients. So if, if India too has to change this profile from only 20% of our patients in target, to at least reach 30 to 40 percent patients in target, we have to move beyond our conventional thinking. And one of that is looking at variability, time in range, um, and more frequent SMBG, of course. So when we say, what do we want in our patient's AGP profile? We want FNIR. What is FNIR? 
we want the profile to be flat as i said we want it to be narrow like that thin snake moving from left to right and we want it to be in range predominantly within that pre specified range so f and ir is the take home mantra for all of you so normoglycemia is the goal and the one below is what we want to see that this is all the profiles we want to have in the interest of time i will stop here and not get into individual agp discussions or therapeutic discussions our idea is to keep strongly introducing the concept of use of technology uh, in in your day to day clinical practice understanding benefits of cgm and understanding benefits of time in range which is a useful metric with this i invite bansi to come up for discussions and at the same time request the team from sarka and and eris um we also invite any of you who wants to get the the cgm fixed on to themselves whether you have diabetes or don't have you want to do that you don't have to disclose to us but you can start using this eris and team would be happy to put the sensor on to you and and give you the connection on the phone to start seeing the data so any of you who you want to they have a volunteer where we will use it but any of you wants to use it also is most welcome one more announcement which i just want to do as uh, manoj already told you that it is the idea that more technology usage should be done in our country and for that we have already started a meeting dedicated meeting only on diabetes and technology and i am sure before two week many of you were the part of that meeting as a audience as a speaker and all those thing and me and manoj along with amit and rakesh if they are there the next year we are planning to have a one dedicated meeting only on diabetes and technology and it will be again a two days and two and a half days meeting which we are planning to do again face to face at goa and that is what our plan from next year it will be a dedicated diabetes technology meeting if you like this venue we'll see <laughs> oh, yes, change uh, it <laughs> <laughs> that's the plan but that's what we are finalizing for that thank you i think yeah so wind up in 10 minutes as the next any volunteers yes right okay just forgot to tell you we charging 5000 how frequently you should do the same thing that self monitoring blood glucose should be done how frequently when smbg came i mean nobody was ready to do it once in a day even and it is to be done before three times a day because you are eating three times you have to uh, taking the insulin three times and you have to do it like so continuous glucose monitoring is a continuous glucose monitoring when 24 by 7 you have to see and continuously you should do it that is what recommended now real time continuous is to be done continuous there is a intermittently scanned continuous glucose monitoring that is is cgm we are using in our country as many of our patients are not affording so we do it uh, this fgm or a professional one every 3 months because that is what a giving you idea a prediction for next 3 months what will be your sugar trend dr uh, pense wants to make some comment i think patients in the age group of 16 17 to 21 they are very aggressive different and they like to indulge now can they cheat cgms i don't think sir the data can be captured it can be remotely monitored you can share the data uh, yeah it is yes Yes. Apps in downloading. Yes. That's the thing that you can. Can. This is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's also a general problem in many others who use it. What happens in the night time? So they will do it at dinner. Like so, they sit there and let's see what's going on. It's about one o'clock in the morning. They get up in the morning and they scan in the evening. Okay. Last few hours they are missing out, and there is a gap longer than the last. I forget. But to simply answer your question, they cheat. No, sir. So that is what. Can you specifically? They cheat. 
hide that for us. Go to two that one eighty six. Jayar only one is a person. Nine target is not. Good. I did mention so above less than thirty percent, ideally less than twenty five, less than and below less than five percent. Again, when we say less than five, you don't have to have five percent. Less than five percent, and if at all less than one percent, the below fifty four range. So you have actually now level one hyperglycemia, one eighty to two fifty. Level two hyperglycemia, which is less than two. Similarly, hypoglycemia is also two level. 70 and 50 level 1 hypoglycemia or time below range level 2 you know want to open the void patient less than 1 okay so some kuch mic nahi hai kya par unke paas in the last two kuch even the ada is the standard चॉकलेट पीस के लिए रहा है। सर that change what you just described patient will be doing some lifestyle modification looking into the readings uh, for the doctor how often can he keep changing the medication to suit the requirement that's what i'm using here पुराना वाला क्रॉस करके नया वाला करके हाँ कौन सा कॉर्ड है इसके लिए एचडीएम है कॉर्ड तो ये इसके लिए कनेक्ट है ओ अभी
getting petrified na don't start me on this and i for hypoglycemia in my mother you going to tell them you're not starting the sulfurenuria a non hypoglycemic you see some petrified you should try it the scanning part i didn't understand the patient has to do something manually on dash this that's real time again this i want to liberate and liberate pro so the pro is a professional one when you have to use there is a doctor that will give you go to many they scan it and they get the while the profit i mean the procedure you take it and they have the and they have to do every eight hours minimum before eight hours they have to flash it out like and now yes here we want to show the real uh, user and the continuous monitor how you can see uh, on your mobile and that's very important i think so for doctor here it's been fixed this is not his reading uh, his will start on his phone after a while so this is the the demo one now uh, this is for the for which right so right. yes yeah, so raj needs to see his doctor and uh, improve <laughs> i know i know but but you should first day i first day to take it. so, so the post meal glucose level is slightly higher so again this technology doesn't require it for scanning what they are using it will directly transform into the phone some technologies require you to move the reader on top of the sensor so So this is the sensor yeah. you can see and here you saw that it was simple to put it up the way yeah. they did it in case somebody else also wants to put it up we'll do it outside the workshop hall uh, it's time for the next it is in the faculty lounge or boardroom we can do it we can, we can do it outside so again a big thank you to all of you for joining us here thank you bansi and of course eris for the support for this workshop and and, and the chairpersons dr akshay kothari and dr rahul dope thank you right an overwhelming response of the doctors who are Absolutely. coming here <laughs> thank you so the next workshop is diabetic foot workshop i request dr jdeep from satara and dr amit from aurangabad to chair this session can i have dr jdeep and dr amit the senior diabetologist from city of satara and dr aurangabad so please be here and then you can invite three uh, so joni could not join suddenly he had developed food poisoning so we have with us dr ashur astogi and dr sarath pandse now over to you thank you thank you sir good afternoon all uh, so i i would like to call upon uh, dr ashur astogi uh, he is basically Uh, from uh, pgi chandigarh a second the most uh, important institute of india and uh, the second person most important person of pgi chandigarh endocrine uh, department he is majorly uh, into diabetic foot and endocrine his special interest in diabetic foot is on charcot and uh, he has got many publications many research papers along uh, on his name uh, over to ashu good afternoon everybody so it was a very interesting session and i also frequently use cgm in patients of diabetic foot and why i use in patients of diabetic foot because again it's a condition which is associated with lot of complications and many patients are also having chronic kidney disease so lot of hypos and hypers i see in these patients and uh, one question i can throw until i have my slides here is that uh, how how many of you believe that tight glycemic control is required for healing of foot ulcers so the whole house says yes but unfortunately that there is no evidence you will be surprised by that so we just did a systematic review and we also did a cochrane analysis uh, unfortunately there is no randomized trial in the world at present which says that intensive glycemic control can heal foot ulcers so this is an irony sometimes we believe but we don't have evidence and another thing i can say i don't know how many of you treat hypercalcemia तो इफ यू ट्रीट हाइपर कैल्सीमिया तो एवरीबडी सेज एमरजेंसी में हाइपर कैल्सीमिया आता है इसको एनएस लगा दो और एक लेसिक्स लगा दो इसका कैल्शियम ठीक हो जाएगा दिस इज द स्टैंडर्ड टीचिंग इवन इन एमडी एमडी मेडिसिन बट अनफॉर्चुनेटली देयर इज नो एविडेंस फॉर एन दिस नॉर्मल सलाइन एंड फ्यूरोसेमाइड फॉर ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ हाइपर कैल्सीमिया प्लीज सर नहीं नहीं आई नेवर सेड दिस सर 
I never said this. So we don't have any randomized trial to say that. But there is a strong evidence that neuropathy can be prevented. Neuropathy can be prevented by six. Exactly. And that's a counter. That's a part of that. So almost all microvascular complications either can be pre prevented or halted. The progression can also be halted, and this includes. Uh, even people have studied this uh, like neutrophil functions also for foot ulcer healing. But again, unfortunately, we always believe in randomized trials like we all believe in SGL2 inhibitors, Emparag, Declare and all these are RCTs. Unfortunately, why, I don't know why in diabetic foot we don't have proper research and proper RCTs. So he's struggling. Amit, can we discuss something until my slides are here? I think they are, they are struggling. Start on your uh, chaco foot uh, management or something sort of. No, no, I will start on this. Yes, it will go. I have photos. Actually, I wanted to show many photos. Photos are more important yeah, rather than a theoretical discussion because it's more of a workshop. Yeah, please. That's very true, sir. So basically, if, if, if there is pain, then something is happening. If there is no pain, nothing is happening. That's the basic thing. And that's the uh, typical picture and the presentation of diabetic foot also. Sir, this is the thing for any chronic disease. If you go to a cardiology meeting, they will say that patients are not worried about their blood pressure. So for any chronic disease, it's the same story. And same goes with diabetes also. So unless the patient has some uh, bad day, Suppose he has a big foot ulcer, suppose he has amputation, suppose he has a ACS or acute coronary event, until and unless they don't just care about that. Maybe it's our responsibility as physicians to counsel them whenever they come to our clinics. So uh, the topic which is given to me is about diabetic foot ulcer, a physician's perspectives. Maybe uh, surgeon uh, Dr. John cannot come. Uh, rest of uh, thing Dr. Sharad sir can definitely take over. So I just wanted to show, show some slides of PGI. I don't know how many of you have been to Chandigarh? Very few. <laughs> Chetan has raised his hand. So Chandigarh is a very good, nice city. Uh, but I was really surprised I was roaming on the roads of Goa, but they are very narrow. So Chandigarh roads are very wide. <laughs> but they are very strict uh, traffic police and all, all these things in Chandigarh. So it, it depends upon what is the presentation of a patient. So you said how to diagnose early. Did you mean that the patient is coming with something? The answer is no. So as a physician, you have to ask the patient to take out his socks and shoes and see what is there in the foot. And the what is there would be a swollen foot, which would be slightly rhythmitous. Patient might not feel any kind of pain, but it will be differential swelling as compared to the opposite side in the same site. So that's most important. So this is just a clinical sense. Now you can go on to your suspicion, whether it is just a cellulitis or maybe, maybe if it is a four foot uh, Charcot's, whether it is gouty arthritis or sometimes even DVT sometimes can have a swelling which can extend till midfoot, but it is unusual. What we do is we always get an X-ray first. So this can be done very easily, but uh, that's very true that X-ray do not show any changes at least up till two weeks. Even the best of the radiologists cannot tell you anything about the changes that can occur on an X-ray up till 14 days. So this is a dictum. Now what we can do, we usually do an MRI. So in our institute, uh, whenever, uh, because I run a diabetic foot clinic, so we are doing MRIs very frequently. And this is the most sensitive investigation for diagnosing Charcot's. I don't say specific, but I say it's very sensitive. It can pick up the marrow intensities or so-called a marrow edema, which is the first thing that comes up. It will be appearing at T2 bright images and that appears just within six to eight hours of so-called uh, acute onset of Charcot's. Nobody knows once the disease starts, but at least when the patient says, I have this swelling only for past one day, even that one day MRI can tell you many things. So MRI is the best thing that we that can tell you.
A wet bearing X-ray has been done. Uh, what we do is uh, we have to keep a pillow or something beneath. Uh, the X-ray film is behind the foot, and we shoot it from front, so that we can get a. Uh, if there is any bony deformity which comes down, we can pick it up. Or else we do a standing X-ray AP. In the AP X-ray, the first ray and the second ray. If there is slightly a dilatation or there is the widening of the angle is there, then that is the first peak, uh, sign at which you can pick up that, that this is the, the foot is turning into a charcoal foot. That's the first X-ray sign which you can find it out. So this, uh, what he is mentioning is related to the Mary's angle. So usually it is 180 degrees. So, but probably it is quite late once you see an abnormality in the Mary's angle. So it means the subluxation of the midfoot down. So the angle becomes like this instead of like this. So this is a 180 degree in a normal me and you because definitely the hind foot is a pillar and it is uh, the forefoot is also a pillar. So there is a two pillars, the foot is like this. So it is like that. So once it mid foot exactly. Once it this is a Liz Franks. That's, 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 that's a Liz Franks. That's a Liz Franks. And second is this Mary's angle. Yes, yes. Second is Mary's angle. Most of the radiologist yeah. will tend to miss this uh, yeah. early sign. So, <laughs> as a physician, I think we need to uh, start learning some radiology. At least radiological aspects of charcoal. I believe that <laughs> a physician is a better radiologist rather than a radiologist. Uh, not to demean any radiologist. Why? Because once you feed that I am suspecting it, then only the radiologist would give a report. Because I have seen, if you just say, X-ray likke bhej do ke foot ka, wo kuch nahi batayega. Because you have to tell I am suspecting charcoal. So you are a better radiologist as a physician rather than a radiologist being a radiologist. Just one point I would like to add Please. for the first question uh, that you have raised, whether the tight glycemic control really helps uh, in healing the ulcer. So as you have said that there is uh, no uh, evidence, uh, but I think that there is a strong evidence that a simple a small doses of insulin that helps patient to heal the ulcer. We have seen so many cases that patient had a very excellent glycemic control and that's why he was never put on insulin. And because of just lack of insulin, ulcer didn't heal for almost six months, one year patients were carrying ulcer. So just a small dose of insulin, irrespective of glycemic control, really helps for the ulcer healing. But that time you need to adjust the dose of oral hypoglycemic agent. But insulin is must almost in every patient of uh, diabetic foot. I, I absolutely agree with you. We have also seen, but again, these are observations. I can say something, he might not agree. Uh, he can't say something, I might not agree. So we have to have something in print, something evidence. And second thing, as you mentioned that uh, glycemic control, what is that tight glycemic control? Does it mean A1C of 8? Does it mean A1C of 7? Does it mean A1C of 6.5? What does it mean to heal an ulcer? I don't know. I, I don't have evidence. Uh, yeah, I think there where the role of uh, glycemic variability will uh, play a lot of role. Maybe, may not be. So I think there yeah, is I'm a prizing this. <laughs> I'm apprising this because we are doing a multicentric trial. So this is a, again an RCT where we are plan we are doing this and this already the methodology is already published. Okay. So now we are doing a trial multicentric, first time in the world, regarding the intensive glycemic control versus conventional control. Let's see. So here the A1C cutoff, sorry sir, we have taken as 8%. Why 8%? Anything less than 8%. Because uh, in vitro studies have shown that if A1C is less than 8%, the neutrophil chemotaxis is the best. So we have taken this analogy. Therefore, we are taking an in intensive as less than 8%. I think that will be another idea to uh, use uh, CGM uh, devices to these patients. Bada mushkil hai, sir. Bada <laughs> Now we foot pay concentrate kar lete hain, CG, <laughs> CGM to kar lenge. Wo hai. That's good. Chalo. We are back. Yeah, I have to give one more. Godless is there. Yeah, I have to give one more. Light 
Hello. So we'll start. So can you close the lights? So this is the part of the country from where I come and where I belong. So this is uh, PGI Chandigarh. This is the, our OPD where uh, all the patients come. So in a, in a day, we see around uh, 1,000 to 1,200 patients of diabetes in a day. So in a month, we see almost, uh, you can guess, we have around three days OPD. So we see around eight to 10,000 patients uh, in a month. This is a huge number. So I mean to say these are all not new patients. So there are some follow-up patients also. I don't know whether they have slight change or not, so I have to change it. And this is the PGI gate. Uh, this is the entrance of this temple. And this picture, uh, you can see. So this picture, uh, Dr. Sharad was also there. So this was taken at the IWF GDF meeting at Haag in Netherlands, where we were there. Uh, and uh, this I was just uh, jogging at the shores of uh, Haag, uh, along the Sea of England. And I was surprised to see this statue. This is a huge six feet statue of bronze. And you can see one leg is amputated. And he's holding his leg here like that. So I just click this photo for you. So this is my OPD. So this is uh, my chamber. Intentionally, I have taken this uh, photo on that day where I have a lot of patients who are trying to get, enter into my room. So this is my other consultant chamber. But this is a routine OPD. And it's like a... It's like a Dadar railway station ki tarah hota hai. Aap mere tak pochna bada mushkil ho jayega agar aayenge to. It's a huge rush. So this is a routine OPD. And this is a routine what the physician sees. So you can have any kind of presentation. It can be an ulcer, it can be a gangrene, it can be a simple callus. It can be simple callus with ulcer. So there are so many things or it can be a whole deformed foot. So this is the, probably a new phase of diabetes in India. We are talking about so many... Uh, rocket science and uh, so many things, but probably this is the truth of uh, our patient of diabetes. And this is how, what is happening. This photo I have clicked from my own patients who are coming with such fancy kind of shoes. And I, in our own study, which we published in uh, International Journal of Lower Extremity Wounds, we found that, that almost 70% of the wounds was because of the poor footwear. And these kind of footwear, as you can see, the first footwear, there is no insole. And unfortunately, uh, they were, and again, this gentleman is having Punjabi jutis. Again, in Goa, I don't know what is kind of the footwear they, they wear. And you can see a nail here. You can see? And this was the reason for the occurrence of ulcer. So unless you ask your patients to remove the footwear, you will not be able to see all these uh, fancy things. That lady is having a hallux valgus. You can see. On top of that, she is wearing a footwear with a foot, uh, thumb hold. This will further worsen her hallux valgus. So you have to ask to change the footwear. And this looks good for a woman, but probably all these toes are jutting out of this uh, footwear and she can bump into any object and she can have an ulcer. So this is a routine and we have to stop both the ulcers and we have to see these kind of footwears. So this is the prevalence of foot ulcers in India and the first study that came in 1994, Dr. Sharath's study is there. The prevalence was mentioned at 3.6%. Then um, in 2009, there was a study uh, where this is our study from our institute, the prevalence is 9% and uh, then again another study in 2012, 14%. So that means the prevalence of foot ulcers is increasing. I don't say that foot ulcer did not exist 20 years back. Probably now, because of these kind of workshops, we as physicians are more accustomed and we know that we have to screen our patients of for diabetes for diabetic foot also. So why diabetic foot is increasing? This is a paper that we wrote along with Dr. Bansali in General Foot of General of Foot and Ankle Surgery. And uh, this probably because of increasing longevity. You will be surprised to know that the average life expectancy of an Indian in 1924 was only 20 years. And now an average Indian is living almost up till 75 years. That means he's bound to have some chronic complications. And one of the complications of an NCD or non-communicable disease is diabetes. So once the patient is living with a longer duration of diabetes, he is bound to develop complications, microvascular complications like neuropathy. And therefore, he might be also likely to develop the so-called telltale consequences of neuropathy, that is foot ulcers. So we explained it by many studies in this review article. And we, uh, this was a beautiful paper which was published by L. Rubion in PLOS One. And what they showed, you can see that with increasing age, this is the age on the x-axis, what is increasing is the foot ulcer prevalence is increasing, the incidence of amputation is also increasing, and gangrene is also increasing. That suggests that probably this is a disease of aging. This is a disease of longer duration of diabetes. And this is going to happen 
and you will have more foot ulcers in your clinics in the near future. Therefore, you have to be very pertinent about how to manage your patients with diabetic foot. So this is a very different kind of paper again we wrote. This is about an Indian scenario because as I showed you some, some of the footwears, so we have a very different kind of socio-cultural milieu in India which is very different from West. So, and that's very important to understand. Most of the patients who come to our clinics come after a lot of homemade treatments or remedies. They are applying some kind of paste on their foot ulcers. They just continue to walk on net foot ulcers. Koi the Ayurvedic medicine le hai. Kuch, they are using any X kind of N number of things. So they come late. So you are likely to get a patient who is having a lot of foot complications in a complicated foot. Moreover, they are using some invalidated or indigenous methods of treatment. Most of them have chronic and they are infected foot ulcers. And uh, in West, uh, Dr. Sharad can also vouch for it. Most of the ulcers, what they say is a neuro ischemic or ischemic. But in India, almost 60 to 70 percent of ulcers are neuropathic. So we mainly see the neuropathic ulcers. And there have been some studies from India also that unlike the West, where they say that gram positive is the most common infection, we see gram negative as the most common infections if we do a culture of these foot ulcers. So you have to be very cautious and we have to use a proper antibiotic which has at least a gram negative cover. So why does foot ulcers occur? This is mainly because of three things as I was mentioning. One is neuropathy, that is loss of protective sensations. Patient lose just the beautiful thing that the God has given us is the virtue of pain and once he loses this virtue of pain he can just go on and go on with a nail in his footwear and he'll then have an ulcer. Second is vasculopathy or ischemic foot and third is poor glycemic control. So I am incriminating poor glycemic control for occurrence of ulcer but again coming back I don't know what will happen if I do a good glycemic control. So in a given patient whenever a patient because this is a kind of workshop so I need to mention that what you should do once a patient lands to you with a foot ulcer. So first thing is, again, you have to assess for neuropathy, you have to assess for vasculopathy, and also you have to look at the glycemic records of the patient. So this is the ADA recommendations, and what they mention is that you have to take a thorough history, that how did this ulcer occur, what is the duration, what is the glycemic control, what are the complications the patient is having, but always and always assess for neuropathy. And uh, you should do at least these tests that are mentioned there, because remember, in the foot, we have the large fibers, we have the small fibers. Small fibers are mainly unmyelinated nerve fibers, which carry the sensation of pain. The large fibers carry the sensation of vibration, and the small fibers again carry the sensation of temperature. Therefore, in north, we have a lot of heat. Now, the, in uh, Delhi, the temperature is 48 degrees. But because of the religious things, people still go barefoot, going to maybe Gurudwara or maybe to the temple and once they come, a diabetic patient never knows he's walking on a hot bed. And once he comes, he develops blisters. So this is quite common in North. So you have to do a temperature or pinprick sensation, which tests for small fiber. And you have to check for the vibration sensation using a 128 hertz tuning fob. And annually, I do, I don't know how many of you do, a monofilament test. I always carry a monofilament. This is a very important test because it predicts ulcer. It doesn't say about neuropathy. But it has been shown to predict the occurrence of ulcer. Yes, it tests for the touch or the crude touch is the thing that is tested by the 10 gram monofilament. And remember, most of the time I see some kind of fancy reports when the patient comes, somebody has done an NCV. I don't know for what purpose the NCV is done. So remember, electrophysiological testing is an absolute no-no in a given patient of diabetes unless you are thinking of some other etiology. And that etiology can be CIDP or chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. But usually these CIDP have a very different presentation. They usually come with motor symptoms. They don't come with sensory symptoms. So if you are having a motor symptoms, think of uh, CIDP and then you can do an NCV which might have a predominant a demyelinating pattern in an NCV. So this is a photo that uh, I took from my rounds when I was teaching my DM students, DM endocrinology students. So we do a monofilament test and these are the site at which we apply the monofilament which is a nylon monofilament of 5.07 size thickness equivalent to around 10 gram linear force. It, as I was mentioning, it tests for touch or the large nerve fiber sensations. But if you have facility, you can do an automated test. You not to do all these kind of tests on your own. So in my lab, this is a picture from my lab, diabetic foot lab in PGI. 
we have all automated neuropathy analyzers in a single maybe around hardly takes two minutes you can test for temperature vibration pain perception so this is a good thing to possess so if you are running a diabetes clinic it's good to have an automated neuropathy analyzer but suppose any of you is uh, working in a village or maybe in a setting or primary healthcare setting still you can diagnose neuropathy and this can be done by this simple test uh, which was described by professor gary raymond from ispwich which is a small city in southern england so this is a test where we ask the patient to lie down on a couch and we sit on to the side of the on to the patient's foot and we ask the patient to close his eyes and then i touch his toes with my fingers so if he can not sense my fingers more than two times touch out of six that means he has lost his sensations of touch and they have predicted that this is a very likelihood of having an ulcer in future so this has been a validated tool so you, just, you need not to do have any kind of sophisticated instru instruments for that and uh, you can follow this uh, you, it is very well shown in this picture just touch that first third and fifth toe and uh, another foot first third and fifth toe so out of six if you cannot perceive more than two something is wrong patient needs a modified footwear and your treatment but for those who work in maybe some advanced centers like me in tertiary referral centers probably speech test is a, a very good uh, maybe i could say specific test but not a sensitive test somebody might say that i want to diagnose neuropathy very early how you can do that so this is done by this instrument that is called a confocal microscopy what is confocal microscopy remember cornea is an organ which is an avascular organ it is not supplied by any blood vessel but it is richly supplied by nerves and these are unmyelinated very thin nerve fibers so what they say in diabetes usually these unmyelinated nerve fibers are first to be affected by hyperglycemia so they get lost and either you can do a biopsy from the skin and test but it is an invasive test so you can do a confocal microscopy you can ask your ophthalmology colleague they can just peep into the eyes and can map the corneal nerves so we are doing this at our centers and this is a very validated tool another thing if you can do is a plantar pressure pedograph system where you can just uh, do a, these pressure pedographs this also again a manifestation of neuropathic foot because of deformities because of neuropathy they have abnormal plantar pressures at particular areas of the foot that can also tell you about the future occurrence of an ulcer at a particular area coming on to the vasculopathy the best thing is do a proper examination palpate pulses both dorsal spidis and posterior tibial do an abi the abi even my residents sometimes falter in doing P abi it is a very simple thing but you need to practice it before you can do it we know that abi 0.9 to 1.3 is normal less than 0.9 suggested of uh, poor vascularity and if it is less than 0.6 it suggests a critical limb ischemia otherwise you can have these um, fancy instruments because i have in my lab this is a non invasive vascular screening device in a simple 2 minutes it can tell you about abi or toe pressures because sometimes abi might be normal but still patient is having a great toe ulcer which is gangrenous so that suggests that maybe the flow till the flexor retinaculum or till the ankle is normal but maybe distal circulation might be abnormal so we are doing this toe brachial index that can be done Two pressures are we are measuring: pulse wave velocity, central aortic pressures, and penile brachial pressures. So this can be done. So this is the overall what I have said uh, said in the past five ten minutes is about how to assess a patient. So whenever a patient turns to you, see patient patient as a whole. Importance of uh, clinical examination, especially anemia, renal failure, the liver failures, any systemic signs of infection, tachycardia, fever, they are very important. if you can do biomarkers do it leukocytosis esr and crp that can help you also see the affected limb and the foot the extent of the infection the look for charcot's uh, arthropathy i have intentionally not mentioning charcot's because it is a huge topic and i we are working uh, for past 10 years on charcot's so i have just kept on foot ulcers because that was the main aim determine abi and do a monofilament and regarding the wound do again a thorough examination this is important slide because whenever we see a patient of ulcer does it mean that all ulcers are infected the answer is no so you need to know what are the signs of infection in a given patient who is coming up with an ulcer and this is a standard uh, maybe you can go back to your guyton days in mbbs in physiology there is a classic signs of inflammation of redness warmth and swelling this suggests that the patient is having infection or i would say inflammation inflammation is because of infection 
So if the patient is having any of these suggest inflammation, if the patient is having a foul smell or a purulent secretion, again it's suggestive of the infected foot ulcers. But sometimes, remember in a diabetes patient, you might not have these inflammatory signs. This might be because of vasculopathy, because of ischemic limb. This might be because of very high glucose and the poor neutrophil chemotaxis. So you can sometimes have to look for some additional signs of infection. And these are very friable or discolored granulation tissue. So if you have an ulcer, which should be bright red, a granulation tissue is bright red, like maybe watermelon. But suppose it is friable and it is discolored, it suggests that it is infected foot ulcer. If it is having foul odor, again it is infected foot ulcer. So this is uh, the guidelines that we follow as I was mentioning. So you can classify your ulcers according to the IDS and IWGDF. You might all be knowing about Wagner's and UTS or University of Texas. We don't follow anymore any of these. We follow this IDS and IWGDF uh, classification system for grading foot ulcers. Now doing all this, this is a very interesting slide and a case that I wanted to highlight. Uh, sometimes you can have surprises. So this patient uh, was a lady around 55 years, who was very fond of gardening. So she once uh, came with this kind of uh, swelling. Can you guess what it could be? Actually, I have mentioned it, but uh, what could it be? Somebody would say lipoma, somebody would say sarcoma, somebody would say, I don't know what. But uh, when we did a biopsy, again it came out to be negative. It was bacterial negative, everything was negative. Then we did uh, remove this. I'll show some x-rays also. You can see the swelling on the x-ray. That swelling on the x-ray and then MRI. MRI is also showing this kind of swelling. So this was a typical fungal infection that is called uh, pheohypomycosis. So we published this as an innocuous foot lump in patient with diabetes. So you can have sometimes surprises in a given patient of diabetes. So we did a histopathology and it showed the fungal life. You can see this fungal life. So surprises is always there. At the end of the examination, whatever you do in a given patient diabetes, you should at least tell this is healthy and this is unhealthy. If it is unhealthy, then you should able to classify this is at risk foot. And this is neuropathic foot, this is ischemic foot. If it is an ulcer, you should able to classify. If it is infection, again, you should classify. And sometimes you can have unsalvageable foot. I'll show you some pictures where you have to immediately send the patient to the surgeon or for amputations. Going from the last part, uh, this is my last part of my presentation is about imaging because we as physicians are very fond of imaging. So not all patients require imaging, but yes, if you are suspecting osteomyelitis, do it. If you are suspecting any bony abnormalities or a foreign body or soft tissue gas, do it. And MRI, if there is suspicion of soft tissue abscess or osteomyelitis. So you can see in this patient, there is more than ulcer, but unless you have not done an X-ray, you would not have tell that this calcaneum is fractured and probably it is osteomyelitis. Sometimes x-ray helps, so it depends upon your clinical judgment. Usually it is said that if an ulcer is for more than two weeks, or if the bone is visible or bone is palpable or probe to bone test is positive, suspect osteomyelitis, do an x-ray. That is always done. Again in a given patient who came with a simple great toe tip ulcer, so you have to do an x-ray because this gentleman was walking on this ulcer for past six weeks. Once we did an x-ray, again it showed resorption of the distal phalanx which was suggestive of osteomyelitis. Now this picture, can anybody tell me what it is this? This is a 53-year-old gentleman who was type 2 diabetes for nine years who came with swelling of this right foot. You can see the swelling. This right foot swelling is there. And for four weeks, he was walking on it. What could be the possible diagnosis? So thank you. So at least now I'm getting the answers. Maybe around eight years back, uh, the people were not giving the answer because most of the answers were cellulitis. This patient was being treated with antibiotics by uh, from outside. And once he came, unfortunately, he had a very bad condition. Whole of his foot bones were fractured, pet foot, the, all the naviculars, cuneiforms, cuboid were gone. The tallow calcaneum joint was destroyed. The calcaneum was also destroyed. So you can have surprises. But surprise only comes to one who knows, who has the wisdom to know the surprises and tell the surprises. So always do an X-ray if you are suspecting Charcot's. That's very important. So we publish this again as a vanishing bone disease uh, in postgraduate medical journal. The last part uh, regarding some nuclear scans. So this is one of a uh, fancy scan you can say, but this is a paper that has been cited by the IWGDF guidelines also. And this is about how to diagnose osteomyelitis in a patient who is having Charcot's foot. 
So what we did is we did a labeled uh, leukocytes. What we, we take 40 ml of patients' own blood, isolate patients' WBC, we tag them with FDG, and again inject them into the same patient. So what happens is, is FDG goes to the site of inflammation because it goes mainly, mainly to the site of increased bone turnover. So it will go to the sites where there is uh, some infection of the bone or inflammation of the bone is going on. Then we have also given leukocytes. So leukocytes goes to the site of acute infection. So this uh, modality was very effective. This is known as a FDG labeled PET CT for diagnosing osteomyelitis in a given patient of Charcot. So these are the pictures or images that we get for this. How to choose antibiotics? Again, this was a paper that uh, we published uh, regarding uh, because I don't know what is happening in this part of the world. But in my center, I mainly see gram negative infections and lot of antibiotic resistance. And we found out that quinolones were almost uh, not helpful in our patients. Around 98% resistance to quinolones was seen in our practice. Maybe because we are a tertiary referral center, maybe you should not be biased by our findings. This is our finding. If you are seeing a patient who has an ulcer for just for five, six days, Maybe a gram positive cover would be the best uh, thing that you can offer to your patients regarding this. And never forget to offload your patient. Once he has an ulcer, you need to offload. You can use these kind of uh, innovative modalities to offload your patient. If the patient is having foot ulcer, you can create uh, ulcer which, uh, mm. sorry, a mold which has a window at the hind foot and which has a uh, contact to the ground on the midfoot as well as the forefoot. If a patient is having forefoot ulcer, you can design these kind of offloading methods. When should a surgeon be called? As I was mentioning, if you are say, having a gas gangrene, immediately surgeon should be called. Uh, abscess or a necrotizing fasciitis, surgeon has to be called. Or if a patient is having critical limb ischemia, a surgeon needs to be called. This is the mortality rate, so never take your patients of diabetes and foot ulcers very lightly. It has been mentioned, this is a paper by David Armstrong uh, way back, but this shows that the death rate with an ischemic ulcer is much higher than maybe Hodgkin's disease or breast cancer or even prostate cancer. So never neglect your patients who come up with a foot ulcer. And same thing we corroborated in this study. This is the first of its kind study, which is uh, a pan-India study of around seven centers in India, which we published in... DRCP. So we had around 4,700 patients of foot ulcers. We followed them for 10 years and we wanted to study what happens to the limb. So they came up with neuropathic foot ulcers and we just studied what is the amputation rate in these patients and how many of them die during next uh, 10 years as compared to a patient of diabetes who are matched duration of diabetes, who are matched age, but he does not have an ulcer. And to our surprise, we found that this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. A patient who has a foot ulcer is more likely to die. Around five times increased risk of death. The mortality was 16% in patients of foot ulcer as compared to who do not have foot ulcer. So please, 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 whenever you see a patient of diabetic foot ulcer, thoroughly screen your patients because you might not see your patient again in your clinic. He might die if you don't take care of our patients very diligently. And same holds true for Charcot's neuroarthropathy. Sir, this is again the first study uh, from India and also from Asia also. We have 260 patients of Charcot's and we compared with 560 patients, double the controls, so diabetes who do not have Charcot's. We followed them for five years and we again found out that the mortality or odds ratio for dying in patient of Charcot's is around 2.7 as compared to a patient who do not have Charcot's but have diabetes. So take home messages, diabetic foot ulcers and infections are associated with very high morbidity and whenever a patient has foot ulcer, most of the cost of the treatment goes around five times or eight times. And DFU usually behave very differently in India as compared to maybe West. So you need to have an indigenous ways of treatment and also the offloading. Proper assessment is very important. Follow the IDSA and IWGDF guidelines to the extent which can be done, but we should have and we are having our in Indian guidelines also. And rational use of antibiotics is always required. So always look at the foot. This is again a Charcot's foot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashu. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashu, for a wonderful presentation. Because of the time constraints, we'll go to the next talk and we'll have a question at the end of the second talk. So, may I invite Dr. Uh, Sharad Painter? Uh, Painter, sir, uh, any introduction? My uh, slide, sir. Slide, sir. Uh, several awards and collections are. Uh, uh, uh,
same story with I'd like to find my person. अरे नाम बता रहा हूँ ना मैं से There is a feeling that sexual position doesn't occur. Or is it rare? Uh, what is the opinion of the crowd or delegates? It's 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 not very common, uh, as uh, Ashu rightly said. Uh, peripheral vascular disease is extremely common in Western countries. Uh, when you see diabetic foot, say 10 cases, half of them are neuro ischemic feet. Uh, but in India, we see more of neuropathic feet rather than neuro ischemic feet. Uh, but this scenario is also changing. As uh, he rightly said, we are also aging. And the peripheral vascular disease occurs with, it's strongly correlated with the aging population. 80 and above. Recently, Dr. Mohan published an article where he published two patients who lived with diabetes for 100 years. Uh, I have just seen one patient, but he died six months later, but he survived for 100 years. But you will all agree with me because I am practicing for 40 years. Nowadays, in my OPD, I see quite few number of patients who are above 80. This is certain. Earlier, it was extremely rare to see an 80 year old coming to OPD, climbing one stair. So, aging population uh, is going to be a major challenge uh, for diabetic foot. And if you see any old person with any diabetic foot problem, think it ischemic unless proved otherwise. Even if it looks like infected, neuropathic, you find, but always keep peripheral vascular disease in mind. Right? Yeah, right. Sir. Uh, any uh, physical on physical examination what uh, things can be seen on uh, physical examination to prove that this is, uh, could be a ischemia or uh, the patient is having a peripheral vascular disease uh, I mean uh, simply on physical examination one is if you feel there is a temperature difference colder uh, limb colder extremity and most important is palpation of the all four pulses, both feet, minimum. So uh, that can give, most of the time we try, tend to forget all these basic examinations. So palpate the pulses uh, and you can think of uh, peripheral vascular disease. Similarly, there are some uh, subtle changes in the feet that occur in a ischemic foot. And if you see a neuropathic foot versus uh, in neuro ischemic feet, the nails, the temperature, the texture of the skin, and uh, in a neuropathic foot, uh, you'll find it's quite warm. This is relatively cold, and uh, patient always says he, he doesn't have. And claudication pain uh, is very important. Uh, although they have neuropathy, they do complain of claudication. Don't think that if you have a neuropathy, you don't get claudication. They do have claudication, but if you have to dig out the history, and claudication is a very strong uh, symptom and uh, evidence for evaluating peripheral vascular disease. Simple examination, what apart from palpating pulses, as he has rightly said, ABI. ABI is a simple Doppler, uh, test, 
where you measure the blood pressure. I have. Uh, uh, I would like to add one more point. Uh, once on uh, physical examination, uh, yeah? if there is a uh, hair loss over the uh, great toe or the first line, that is the first sign where you can say that it is uh, the patient is having a uh, PBT. Peripheral artery disease. Yeah. That's the name. Yeah. Definitely, definitely, definitely. That's true. Uh, uh, there is a dictum actually what we say is that if the foot is uh, if you can't able to reconstruct the foot it is better to ampute the foot and give the uh, uh, person the prosthesis so that the life is prolonged like his, like uh, he can get down to his early uh, routine and the rest of the things can be managed very easily so rather than saving a foot uh, that uh, the foot is which is non uh, viable or what we can see it as uh, the foot is not uh, able to walk on that the same foot it's better to get the foot amputed and give a very good process. We have got a very wide range of processes across the uh, thing. We, the process starts from 10,000 to th 3 to 4 lakhs now. So we have got a very ra uh, large range of processes. So that can be taken care of. Regarding the CT peripheral angio, invariably all the patient, uh, the renal parameters are altered. In this case, how you are going to proceed? Uh, what we do is, uh, we go a uh, CO2 induced uh, uh, angiography. There is a different kind of angiography yeah, where we yeah. uh, do a CO2 yeah. induced angiography mm -hmm. and then you can proceed with the angioplasties as well with then, that. Uh, yeah. Wait a second. Okay, then third. Okay. Sorry? Go. Next. Doppler. Next. Uh, Only this. This. Huh? this go yeah. up. Sir, regarding go CT down. angio, your question. Next is Doppler. So, yeah, next I'm really down. skeptical down, down, about down, down, CT down. angio. So, you're absolutely right. Most of the patients who turn up with gangrene but or PVD. Are they seeing? No. No, sir. Abhi nahi. So, usually. They have CKD. So we do CT angio so when we are planning an intervention. I have found the slides on my screen. They are yet to come on the bigger <laughs> screen. But we will CT angio discuss CT angio. So CT angio, as he is absolutely right, carbon dioxide insufflation angiography that we got. It's not available at routine centers. So CT angio is very troublesome. We have seen patients who are doubling of creatinine, landing into renal failure and dialysis also. So do a CT angio only if you are planning an intervention. Planning an intervention can be done by Doppler itself. Because Doppler can tell you whether the patient is having a stenotic segment of an artery or not. CT angio only tell whether probably you will have a multiple segment uh, occlusion as there or whether when you are planning a balloon angioplasty or a stenting. But Doppler is a very good model to tell you whether you want to intervene or not. And uh, it's very true that around 80% do not require any intervention. They can be managed by intensive medical treatment. Sorry, Mike. Mike. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for helping me. So uh, we are going to have session not on peripheral vascular disease, critical leg ischemia. Next. By definition, it is characterized by chronic ischemic at rest pain. So it's not pain on walking. Even at rest, they get pain. There is gangrene or ulcer in one or both legs attributable to objectively proven arterial vascular disease. Critical limb ischemia implies chronicity and is to be distinguished from acute limb ischemia, which occurs with embolism. Uh, highest rate is seen among older subjects, smokers, and long-standing diabetics. The rate of primary amputation ranges from 10 to 40 percent, and due to its negative impact on the quality of life and the poor prognosis, both in terms of limb salvage and survival, carries a very negative impact. The challenging problems are healing is very slow, mainly seen this entity in old age, the high rate of complications, amputation rate is very high, increased morbidity, mortality, and most important, 
most of these patients are old, so there is less family support and the treatment is very expensive. So the quality of life becomes poor. They have painful, sleepless nights. It's pathetic to see a patient who is sitting all the time in the bed throughout night because he cannot sleep because of severe pain. And the diagnosis, lifespan is short. Diagnosis is often missed. Vascular investigations are carried out even now in India, only in 50% of the patients. Up to 90% PAD can be missed if you rely only on symptoms. Next. And we have seen this slide before. Uh, the relative five-year mortality is next to two deadly cancers, pancreatic cancer and lung cancer. Third comes critical leg ischemia. So the relative five-year mortality, this uh, uh, Ashu has already shown this slide. Next. The problem with critical leg ischemia is in addition to proximal lesions, which is very common in diabetics, like femoral, iliacs, there is uh, involvement of infrapopliteal vessels. They are anterior tibial, posterior tibial, peroneal. These infrapopliteal vessels are, and the problem is there are no collaterals or less collaterals. There is heavy calcification, as you can see, and there is heavy shunting. So uh, nature doesn't overcome the problem. So infrapopliteal disease is the cause for critical leg ischemia. Next. Now if we try to compare coronary artery disease and peripheral arterial disease, we find that coronary artery disease uh, is a low pressure. It occurs, the flow, uh, occurs in diastole, while in peripheral arterial disease, high pressure and occurs in systole. Restenosis is low in coronaries, is very high in peripherals. Calcification is less common in coronaries. Calcification is very common. Balloons, when we put in the coronary vessels, they are very well protected by rib cage. While peripheral stents are so superficial in posterior tibial or even dorsalis pedis that they get easily damaged. The revascularization uh, is extremely difficult. Revascularization is very easy in coronary. And most important, uh, the coronary artery disease, the life expectancy is long. The patients are relatively young, 60s, and they are the breadwinners and the boss of the family. And therefore, everybody is willing to pay the bills. Although they run in lakhs, they don't mind because he's the boss, breadwinner. While uh, critical leg ischemia occurs in old grandfathers who where others are reluctant to spend, and it's very expensive to treat revascularized peripheral vessels. So coronary infrapopliteal vessels are coronary and infrapopliteal vessels below uh, are of the same size. So when the revascularization started, they used to use coronary stents for uh, revascularizing infrapopliteal vessels. Now things have changed. Next. So all over the world, because of priming of the vessels with thrombolytic agents, rivaroxaban and anticoagulants, small diameter, long stents, drug coated stents and cutting balloons, debulking tools, all these advancements have lead, led to uh, better results in peripheral vessels with uh, endovascular uh, interventions. And therefore, the only indication for peripheral bypass is failed angioplasty or stenting. 20, 30 years back, Peripheral bypass was the only option left for peripheral arterial disease in propopliteal, but now nobody does peripheral bypass surgery. Endovascular is the first, and you can repeat in a number of times. And newer stents are coming next. Now look uh, at 
the technique that has been developed uh, in revascularization. Here you can see occlusion in intrapopliteal vessels and angioplasty of all the three arteries, anterotibial, posterior tibial, uh, have been done. You can see pre and post operative in the bottom line, and you can see all the vessels have been opened just by uh, recanalization. So much success can be um, obtained by all, if, even if all the three vessels are diseased and completely blocked, you can open them. Uh, very effectively with priming of the vessels and proper angioplasty next. Another preoperative, you can see hardly any flow in the foot. There is no vasculature seen and post-procedure you can see the vessels have been opened up, dilated and you can see the anterior tibial as well as posterior tibial. So, so good results can be now obtained with newer stents. Next. Another case, you, you hardly see any vessel on the left, but post-stenting you can see uh, complete revascularization. The arch has been completed, anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and the whole foot is now fully revascularized. Next. Another patient with intrapopliteal uh, this is pre and post angioplasty on the upper side. Similarly, pre and post angioplasty. And again, in this picture, you can see there is hardly any vessel seen in preoperative. And this is post tenting uh, or after angioplasty. And you can see the anterior tibial has been completely open with its branches. This is, uh, again, you can see uh, after procedure, you can see the vascularization has been uh, achieved in right lower limb. Next. Again, you can see post angioplasty in the same patient. The foot has been again completely revascularized and critical leg ischemia is taken care of. Next. Similar results here you can see pre procedure left lower limb. Now, so the next. And you can see the anterior tibial, all the three peroneal vessels, uh, anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and peroneal, all have been opened very successfully. And look at the ABI. We talk of ABI, and, uh, and it is usually 0.9, but in these patients, 0.43. And after the procedure, it has come back to 0.95. They did also toe pressure, which was 0.33, came to 0.8. So you can achieve vascular, uh, complete vascularization of the limb and relieve the patient of severe pain and critical leg ischemia. Next. So the management of peripheral arterial disease has changed. There is a paradigm shift in revascularization in last 20 years or so. And now we only talk of endovascular first, never talk of bypass surgery. The advances in endovascular therapy in recent past has surpassed open surgical bypass to a great extent. All proximal vessels, even multiple occlusions of distal intrapopliteal vessel are amenable to endovascular procedures in expert hands. In many institutions world over, the endovascular approach is the currently first choice of treatment. Even in smaller city like Nagpur, we have four centers. And expert, uh, uh, these, uh, whatever the, you call them, they are physicians and trained in only peripheral vessel uh, revascularization. They also do cranial, carotid, and other uh, reaching the uh, bleedy, bleeders and other things but their main expertise is in peripheral artery. Therapeutic alternatives in diabetic foot patients without option of revascularization. Here you can see the healing of foot wounds in patients with diabetes is frequently complicated by critical life-threatening ischemia and imminent arterial revascularization is imperative in order to avoid amputation. However, in many patients, this is not no longer possible because sometimes it's too late 
or the patient is too sick uh, and then some hospitals recommend some illogical i won't i won't say illogical but without any strong evidence and procedures like gene therapy stem cell therapy hyperbaric oxygen sympathectomy spinal cord stimulation and uh, worsen because they charge heavily and patient doesn't get any relief but they pretend and they show evidence but practical speaking all this really doesn't work appropriate wound care strict offloading conservative treatment may be the effective alternative timely amputation in such patient timely amputation can accelerate mobilization and improve the quality of life next uh, as uh, ashu has seen, uh, said earlier prevalence of pvd if you look at this this is my article in 1994 from india and it showed prevalence of 3.79 vijay vishwanathan 2005 showed uh, in chennai 4 madurai 6 3.2 in uh, velour next uh, i wrote in 1998 with better disease care longevity of diabetics will increase and we'll have more and more long standing and elderly diabetics it will not be surprising next no go back it will not be surprising to see an increasing prevalence of pvd in indian diabetics from 2.6 now it has already crossed 20 uh, this i wrote in 1998 next this is the fastest growing population this is a problem elderly in india facts the elderly population was 24 million in the year 1961 and you can see elderly in 2001 in india 77 millions now by 2051 it will be 300 one age above 70 29 132 so multiple times our aging population is going to increase and age above 80 is fastest growing from 8 it has uh, by 2051 it will be four times more 32 life expectancy at birth in 2009 in usa was around 80 now it is 83 but in india at that time it was only 64 now we are touching 69 70 and we expect that it will be 75 and 80 in next 10 to 20 years so no 90% of the old people in india have no social security no insurance and hardly any family support unfortunately and that's going to pose a major problem while treating critical leg ischemia which is a disease of elderly next now there are lot of advances occurring in the stents sirolimus eluting stent this is a anti cancer drug as we all know and it's uh, eluted from this stent and it prevents the vascular new vascularization inside the stent so it kills by chemo chemotherapy and therefore the stent's occlusion Uh, it doesn't occur otherwise stent occlusion was a major problem earlier nitinol self expanding stents this technology has developed and temporary implants composed of biocompatible material bioabsorbable stents are also available after certain years these stents will be absorbed future and infrapopliteal stents the development of small vessel sirolimus eluting self expanding stents and sirolimus eluting absorbable stents are going to come up that will improve the revascularization further next so till then we keep these primary goals of treatment for critical leg ischemia one relieve the ischemic pain heal neuro ischemic ulcer prevent limb loss improve the quality of life prolong amputation pre survival next and 
so the, although this topic is little discouraging very depressing but it's come going to we are going to face all these patients in near future so my message to you if you are taking a ward round find foot case bandaged foot above 70 even if it looks neuropathic don't just believe get the basic investigating abi at least uh, ultrasound doppler in every elderly patient who comes with diabetic foot although clinically you may diagnose him neuropathic but always look for uh, abi look for ultrasound examination if it's not very classical case and if the patient is 80 plus always take it from me it's going to be peripheral vascular disease on top of neuropathic foot so there may be neuropathy but peripheral vascular disease which needs to be attended thank you thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you. Uh, for a wonderful lecture and uh, i request uh, dr ashu to uh, come front we'll have uh, some question and session. still we have eight minutes for the next session if there are any questions from the audience When can, we can, can you switch up? Yeah. Sir, when we can expect good vascularity in the extremities after the stent? Oh, yes. Yeah, we can uh, measure the pulsations, we can measure the ABI as I showed you. ABI improved from 0.33 to 0.8. So, this is a simple bedside procedure you can, but you can also do angiography. Sir, your answer is immediate. 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 Sir. Once the stain yeah. is there, once the uh, stenosis is removed, the pressure gradient of the artery which is there, the pressure comes from the heart, greatly goes down and the artery opens up and the flow is immediate. You can see the results. You can see it immediately. Sir, my intervention radiologist, whenever we plan a DSA, that is digital subtraction angiography. And then they do a balloon angioplasty. They do a check angio. And then they do a post uh, angioplasty runoff angio. Okay. Yeah. So immediately within seconds, it'll the results would be there. But that result might not transform into the healing of ulcer immediately. It might take time, as expected. But if the patient gets relief, that's the best reward that you get because it's a different pain that a critical limb ischemia produces. It's not simple pain. They are just not sleeping all they were they are just sitting and shouting most of them are 70 and above male female females are common yeah one thing i li just like to highlight uh, sir has shown one slide and one drug was mentioned there rivaroxaban yeah how many of you use you use rivaroxaban or how many of you are aware what is rivaroxaban that's good at least we are aware so this is a factor 10a antagonist so yeah, we <laughs> so in peripheral vascular disease, uh, in all my patients of peripheral vascular disease are on rivaroxaban. Now why they are on rivaroxaban, I'll tell you. This is after the two trials that have been yeah. published in New England Journal. One was a compass trial, second was an endeavor trial. And uh, all of these trials were done in the peripheral arterial disease patients who had a critical limb ischemia and they already had a CAD or any other ASCVD. And there were two uh, outcome measures. One was limb, they now they call male because we are very fond of MACE. That is major adverse cardiovascular outcomes. This is called male. Male is a major adverse limb outcomes or limb events. So they significantly reduce mm -hmm. the male events. That is the risk of amputation, the risk of uh, revascularization, a second revascularization. And they also reduce the CV mortality. So I think given a choice, your do patient should be do benefited. Do you by. use it in atrial fibrillation? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Why not? This is a very common indication for using this drug. Dose is 2.5 milligram BD. This is the standard dose in New England Journal. Yeah, so you can talk about ticagrelor, but unfortunately ticagrelor was associated with hemorrhagic strokes. The risk of hemorrhagic stroke was much higher. Epixaban has not been tried in patients with PAD. The we have evidence with this. And the dose is very different as uh, uh, by a cardiologist they use 10 or 20. We have to use 2.5 BD. Mm. 
exactly so in these trials all patients were on 100 mg of aspirin now 100 is not available in india so our patients are around 75 or 150 but yes there were around 10% of patients who were on dual antiplatelets dapt that is clopidogrel and aspirin so they were found to be safe yes there were more number of numerically number of uh, bleeding events with rivaroxaban plus dapt but statistically that was not significant Why yes not? yes all patients should be on statin and in, in fact uh, all diabetic patients or non diabetic patients above certain age have to be on statins not aspirin but statins ha huh? silastazol no yeah please please complete it. yeah exactly exactly, exactly. Podiatrist. Pod yes. Podiatrist. Podiatrist. One good center is in Amrita. Uh, Amrita. Amrita. Amrita Institute. Uh, and one good center is in Bangalore Bangalore. with uh, Jain. Jain was clear. So, your question regarding, he is asking about Celestozole. Celestozole. So, Celestozole, sir, there are two, three things about Celestozole. First, what is the outcome measure that we are trying to study by giving Celestozole? So is it like, like we use DAPT for prevention of coronary events? It might not be for the limb events. So that we should understand. Clopidogrel and aspirin is for CV events, not for the gangrene. Now, cilistrozole is mainly for the limb Claudic events, and that is pain-free walking distance. Yes, yeah. claudication is the only indication for. You can improve the pain-free walking distance by using cilistrozole. So don't use cilistrozole if the patient is not having claudication. If you want to heal the ulcer with cilastrozole, big cross. Yeah. Mainly claudication pain. Uh, Absolutely no. In ischemic, no. Uh, uh, I would like to ask both of you. Uh, would you uh, throw some of the lights on uh, how to offload or what is the diabetic foot ulcer? In neuropathic foot ulcer, Offloading is the main mode of treatment. And we uh, physicians in general are so eluded uh, by the word offloading. Uh, offloading is not anything. You just remove the pressure on that ulcer. So something has to be there proximally so that the ulcer remains hanging. Now it could be anything. PCC, it could be shoe, half shoe. So offloading is prime for new healing neuropathic ulcer. Otherwise, neuropathic ulcer with all sorts of treatment will never heal unless you do offloading. Neuro ischemic ulcers, offloading has limited value. It's not uh, because of, but uh, you can always use good footwear for neuropathic, hey, neuro ischemic. I can take this question with a pinch of salt. There are two <laughs> things yeah. how I can answer this question. One is guidelines. Second is what we do and what we practice. So guidelines don't mention any kind of no. topical antibiotics. So there are a lot of metronidazole and creams and all these stuffs. Unfortunately, none of them have been backed by evidence and we don't use it. In my institute, yes. I'm not allowed to use those. We don't use any topical antibiotic. Now More importance is offloading. Yeah, exactly. Uh, not the dressing you are using. Many people feel that 500 rupees, 800 rupees worth dressing is going to heal the ulcer uh, even without offloading. Without offloading, it's never going to heal. But so yeah. one thing, and then you can, uh, depending on your experience, but simple dressing is good enough. So regarding uh, second part, what we do and what we practice. So regarding practice, as Amit wanted me to speak up, so I'll speak up. So if the wound is exuding, exuding means I believe that it is a wound which is not so infected. 
but it is exuding. It is having a lot of uh, transudate or uh, discharge. the discharge is coming. So we use foam dressings. You can use any of the foam dressings and they have a very good absorbent capacity yeah. and that can be used. And sometimes you have a very wound which is very dry. There you can use some kind of uh, moist like moist dressings, dressings or gel dressings. So these are available, but it depends on your wisdom. I believe they are very, very costly, exorbitantly yeah. costly. They are around 800 rupees dressing. Yeah. And 800 rupees, I will give treatment for diabetes for next one month. All oral anti-diabetic drugs and will be there. I'll just re-emphasize the importance of offloading and these uh, expensive dressings. Uh, the patient with neuropathic ulcer came to me because it was not healing for six months. The reason was the doctor was calling him every second day. He used to come from his house, auto rickshaw, climb and go. So offloading is lost and then charge him so heavily with uh, expensive dressing. The first thing we did was we stopped his visits to doctor, our clinic also. We did uh, basic offloading, basic cleaning of the ulcer and sent our social worker dressers at patient's residence. Because if the patient has to come every day or alternate day with all sorts of auto rickshaws, climb, and then offloading is useless. Thank so you. So keep him at home. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Ashu and uh, Dr. Sharath Pence, sir, for a wonderful uh, session. And <laughs> we are on the uh, time. Uh, so I thanks again uh, uh, our speakers, uh, Chairperson, Dr. Amit, and myself. So we are moving to the next session, that is basics of diabetes. For that, I will uh, invite Dr. Snehal Tanna, Senior Diabetologist from Jupiter Hospital, Mumbai and uh, Dr. Sushil Patel, uh, Senior Diabetologist from the Akshar Diabetes Center, Varudra. So over to you, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, after this interesting session about the foot, and quite in detail, I, uh, I presume, and it was quite to the basic. Again, another uh, basics of topics, and uh, we will be covering three topics today. First one will be on PIR and time in range, which is now uh, the kind of fourth dimension in the management of diabetes that we see. Uh, it will be taken over by Dr. The Thank you. So our first speaker doesn't need any kind of introduction. He's a well-known speaker in India. A professor L. Srinivas Murthy is a MD, FRCP, FRCP, Glasgow, Edinburgh, London, USA and many more degrees in his credit and uh, senior consultant uh, physician and diabetologist at Life Care Hospital and Research Center, Bangalore. So not going in the total detail of his CV, CV is, it is mentioned over the screen. Over to you, sir, for your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Sushil. And uh, very nice to see you all physically. Audible? Yes. Audible, right. Okay. Thank you. And uh, let's move on to the topic about the clinical implications of glycemic variability and the rising horizon of tenric liptin evidence and that is with respect to the top TIR study. That is what I am going to talk about. Before getting into the topic per se, let us look at the glycemic assessment in diabetes. What we routinely do is through HbA1c and the limitations I am sure all of you are aware about the HbA1c which cannot access the hypoglycemias or the glycemic variability basically and it can get influenced with a simple conditions like anemia, hemoglobinopathies. chronic liver disease, iron deficiency, etc. And of course, it will not pick up your magnitude of the fluctuations which we see in a daily life in a diabetic patient. And more importantly, the intraday and interday fluctuations are never picked up with your A1C. So the management of diabetes, now there is a paradigm shift from looking around only the A1C, FBS, PPBS, then also adding on the glycemic variability and the hypoglycemia component. So all peaks do not look good in clinical practice. So the glycemic variability comprises of both postprandial glucose spikes as well as the hypoglycemic spikes. So this is what it looks at. So the standard deviation when you calculate across these four points which are seen before each meal and at bedtime do not reflect this variability and these glucose measures are similar between the two patients which you see in two different colors when it comes to the A1C but actual picture is this which is picked up by your CGM. Now what are the various 
glycemic variability indices this is what we do all of these are statistically done of course as uh, 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 clinicians we may not be very keen in that so there is no generally accepted gold standard and little consensus regarding which method offers the most meaningful assessment among these so among the most commonly used method is the standard deviation for this glycemic variability and cgm is something which picks up most of these indices so the serum markers of glycemic variability are these again in routine clinical practice we use only the a1c part more common and all these are seldom used in clinical practice so the mage are the mean amplitude of glycemic excursions what we see in this when it is more the glycemic instability is higher that is what it means and of course the glycemic variability will comprise of all these interconnected issues in our routine clinical practice starting from the fear of hypoglycemia the high a1c is reluctance to intensify the clinical inertia from the both the doctors and the patients and the complications associated with this reluctance and severe hypoglycemia all these will lead on to this and this is the evidence what we are talking about the glycemic variability whether it has got any clinical implications look at this long term visit to visit glycemic variability as a predictor of both micro and macrovascular complications in diabetic patients so there is a clear cut evidence in this one year study which has clearly shown the relationship between the two so the glycemic variability is a predictor of hypoglycemia and we know hypoglycemia is in turn associated with significant morbidity and mortality and frequent or large glucose fluctuations independently contribute to all these complications so you can look at this slide and the correlation i have given the references in the brackets glycemic variability is a independent predictor of prevalence of peripheral neuropathy retinopathy and of course the variability is assessed against the arterial stiffness again a surrogate marker and the studies have clearly shown improved outcomes of micro and macrovascular complications by minimizing this glycemic variability so that's the importance of the glycemic variability in clinical practice so how do you look at this or diagnose obviously through cgm i'm sure we have been undergoing a lot of training including workshops on cgm in diabetes india today and yesterday and cgm clearly provides a robust data about short term glycemic control and it gives metrics in the percentage that's the only confusion we have and of course now most of us are used to it tr refers to the time actually spent by the patients in the target range that is 70 to 180 mg so 70% of the times in a given 24 hour cycle they have to be in that range of 70 to 180 that's called time in range and above and below are something which is above 180 below 70 again there are classifications you can see there uh, the tir time above range the percentage of readings and time spent above 250 that's called level 2 hyperglycemia between 181 to 250 it's called level 1 hyperglycemia and as i said 70 to 180 is in range below uh, 74 to 69 that is below 70 is level 1 hypoglycemia and level 2 hypoglycemia 54 and below is level 2 and that's what we do in most of the clinical trials when there is a cgm involved the level 2 hypoglycemia is what we are always worried about and the ada 2022 this is what is the guidelines you can see in the lesser shaded ones the goal above 70% each 5% increase is clinically beneficial and time below range is the goal is less than 4% of the time in a given day they have to spend and these are the goals for both type 1 and type 2 diabetics mostly given by uh, the cgm now what is the importance of the tir if you reduce tir 10% reduce that means it's a negative there is a increased risk of retinopathy by 60% microalbuminuria by 40% neuropathy by 25% and that's the importance of maintaining the tir in that 70 to 180 range so whether tenlegliptin has got any evidences regarding the glycemic variability component in the background of cgm is the question so we know tenlegliptin so far there is lot of real world evidences about the effectiveness of gliptins in indians we all know that they perform better in indian context and this is one of the real world retrospective study which is multi center and 12 weeks and you can see the results very clearly there are two studies called treat india 1 and 2 and both of them have gives us insights about the effectiveness of tenlegliptin with respect to the patients with the renal impairment and also patients on different age groups including above 65 years there is a clear cut evidence in these two trials which are all again indian trials and lot of uh, uh, noise was made about the qt prolongation with tenlegliptin which is seen at the not at the 20 mg or 40 mg which we rarely use and this is the evidence again indian trials which have seen qset 1 and qset 2 and what was the conclusion these studies 
clearly showed tenlecliptine is effective in reducing the A1C and up titration did not cause 240 mg from 20 to 40 mg did not cause QT, QTC interval prolongation in Indian diabetic patients. Very clear cut and these are all seen in a very high dosages which is not routinely used in clinical practice. And this is a paper which talks about a review on cardiorenal safety of tenlecliptine wherein it clearly showed that there was no QT prolongation at a clinically relevant dosage, very important. Small but significant improvement in the LV function, improvement in the adiponectin level. This is a class effect kind, you know. For all DPP4s, we have this increase in adiponectin levels. That is why it works, performs better in Indian context. And improvement in the endothelial dysfunction. Okay, let us quickly look at the top TIR study, which meant tenlecliptin effect on glycemic control through parameters of the time in range. Now, this was a prospective multicentral open label study where they studied the effect of tenlecliptin on glycemic control through the parameters in the TAR matrix using the CGM. That's important. It's a CGM background study. So, we know the study rationale is tenlecliptin is most widely prescribed gliptin as of today in India. Orally administered at a, days of, uh, a dose of uh, 20 mg OD, and that's important, can be updated up to 40 mg. There is a limited data on tenlecliptin with respect to the TIR. It was not there and hence this study was planned. So primary objectives to evaluate the percentage of time in range in patients treated with tenlecliptin and to evaluate TIR, TBR, glycemic control and tolerability. Three study sites, Dr. Unikrishnan, Dr. Bansi Sabu and Dr. Suha Sernade. Study drugs, tenlecliptin 20 mg, metformin. So study endpoints to look at the primary endpoints basically is the change in time in range percentage of readings which were from baseline to post-treatment phase 1 and phase 2. Basically, it was divided into phase 1 and phase 2 studies, which I'll just show you. And of course, secondary endpoints regarding all the TARs and TBRs ranges, which we discussed earlier. And changes in the A1C, FBS, PPB is also was considered along with your CGM. And of course, to look for any incidence of adverse events or serious adverse events. Inclusion criteria, male, female patients having diabetics above 18 years, less than 65 years were taken. Diabetics, uncontrolled and stable dose of metformin therapy at least for six weeks and having A1C above 7.5. The upper limit was not uh, uh, fixed. And people who are gliptins naive. So there has to be on a monotherapy with metformin, stable dose, six weeks. Exclusion criteria routine, type 1, people who are on insulin, diabetic ketosis, severe hypoglycemia, hypersensitivity to the drug. All these patients were ruled out. And this is the chart which talks about the study design. You can see the pre-treatment wherein day one to day four, the CGM starts off from here only, day one, before the actual patients are exposed to the drug. So day five onwards, the treatment starts with the 10 leg liptin and goes until 14. And the second one is day 33 to day 46. Basically, 43, 46 days, about six weeks, the study was done. And the second CGM was post-treatment phase. So, of course, for all the patients, a uniform diet plan is uh, applied like any other clinical trial. And there was no addition of any other anti-diabetic drug throughout this period. There was no rescue therapy. So the patients had to be dropped out if they require a rescue therapy. That was a study design. So efficacy, the assessment of all primary and secondary endpoints, safety assessment, monitoring and recording of all adverse events, SAEs. Now, what are the results? So end of the day, we had only 42 patients remaining in this because of the patients 59 because of the CGM data could not be obtained for one patient due to device malfunction. And 44 to 42, the outliers, two patients with extreme values of CGM were identified as outliers and were excluded. As I said, there was no rescue in this, so they were excluded. So we had 42 patients. And of course, many of you might have questioned, this was a statistically significant numbers for the study. They're not low numbers. So parameters, the results, you can see the fasting and PP reductions, including the A1C reduction. And other parameters were looked into and these were all the results. Of course, the glycemic parameters, what we are interested, A1C has got a statistically significant reduction. The CGM parameters, that is what we are interested in this study. Look at the mean percentage TIR, statistically significant number at the end of phase one. Phase one is just 14 days. 14 days, in that five days, the patient was not on the drug. Fifth day onwards, the drug was started. Just in nine days, look at the achievement. So end of phase two, of course, this is six weeks and it is maintained. That is what we want, sustained effect. And six weeks, the sustained effect of seen mean percentage of TIR, the time above range is reduced, you can see in the pink bars, and the glucose management indicator, which is one of the indices for the glycemic variability, has dropped significantly after the six weeks. And again, the same thing, which is shown, of course, a lot of statistics, but end of the day,
the results are highlighted. The percentage of time in range, 70 to 180, you can see at the end of 14 days, at the end of 60 weeks, both are maintained, which is a statistically significant number. So comparison of TAR between the baseline phase one, phase two, for all these patients, you can again see split up, which is clearly shown the improvement. So tenlegliptin was safe, well tolerated. The minor uh, hypoglycemias were not recorded and there were no side effects reported, unlike in any other trials. So look at this data, which is of course not related to top TIR. 3,000 patients were exposed to tenlegliptin for a duration of 52 weeks in clinical trials. 300 healthy subjects were also exposed. Only 10% of them experienced the adverse event. This is just to show you the data, which is usually seen in routine clinical practice. And hypoglycemia was only 3%. Constipation was seen in 0.9%. This is in general, not related to top TIR. And of course, some of us have had earlier about pancreatitis, and this is very clearly seen. The tenlegliptin is not associated with pancreatitis. Similarly, the CV risk, again, approximately two and a half like patients were exposed to this, and there was no signal for any increased cardiovascular risk. There is no CVOT trial, but this is what is the data which is pulled out retrospectively. And the safety when it comes to, because our trial, top TAR, showed less than 65 years, and I'm showing you a data where more than 65 years also the patients have been covered, and the safety is very, very clearly shown. And of course, there is an external comparison. This is a, another interesting top TIR compared with the CANA in combination with tenlegliptin. You can see in the middle portion, it was for five weeks. And look at the results when you add on with the CANA. There is a definitive improvement in the time in range segment by about 11 by 11%. Uh, I think it's not working. Okay. And this is another study which is called TEDDY, the tenlegliptin 20mg versus placebo. Again, you can see the time in range CGM data which is improved with the, all the parameters. So the key uh, pharmacokinetic features and clinical benefits of tenlegliptin in general has got a long half-life, so once a day administration, convenience, patient compliance, adherence, that advantages we have. And it can be taken irrespective of the meals. It has uh, got a minimal chances of drug-to-drug -drug interaction because of dual mode of excretion. And of course, dose adjustment is not required in mild to moderate hepatic or renal dysfunction. Again, these are all the convenient factors apart from the pricing in our Indian context we should think about. To summarize, tenlegliptin treatment reduced the glycemic variability. There was a significant improvement in the mean TAR and TAR at the end of the study compared to baseline. And there was also significant improvement in the mean A1C at the end of the study as compared to baseline. And tenlegliptin led to early glycemic improvement. That is, at the end of just 10 days, and it was well tolerated. And thus, tenlegliptin can be a very promising drug to reduce glycemic variability in our Indian patients. And that's the most important, apart from the cost convenience, OD preparations, and dual mode of excretion, no dose adjustment is required in a mild to moderate uh, my, uh, hepatic or renal uh, insufficiency. So thank you very much for patient hearing. Thanks a lot, Dr. Srinivas uh, Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, or I'd like to just uh, at the end of it, or we can take right. Yeah, yeah, we can. I think I've completed before time. So, yes, so we can. We do have one. Dr. Jain Panda has got more time too. <laughs> So uh, a, a question from my side, uh, one about the TR and the one regarding the person. So about the TR, just wanted to know, uh, you stressed a lot about TR being more uh, uh, relevant to the hypoglycemia. Uh, no, both. No, sorry, glycemic variability. Glycemic variability. It's more related, I mean, more throws more light on the hypoglycemia versus the hyper. Is it, I mean, that's what I kind of gathered. Is it so? No. Glycemic variability gathers both hypo and hyper. Yeah, but, but not the TIR. Not the TIR. The, the glycemic variability, yes. does it un, I mean, uh, throw more light on the hypoglycemia as compared to the rest of the parameters that we see in our practice? Definitely. It is a better marker because most of the hypoglycemia, especially in the night, early mornings, are not picked up, right? Right. By the patients. Okay. And uh, regarding tenlegiptin, I uh, one just wanted to know the, all these studies were with metformin or uh, against placebo or with uh, canagliflozin. Yeah. Uh, how about using this drug as a third line drug or, or probably a later on drug? Tenlegliptin. Definitely. Th there are evidences. There are evidences about all that. Except CVOT, tenlegliptin got all the other trials versus, like the TEDDY trial was against a placebo. There was one with CANA we showed. There is with insulin. There is with SUs. All these evidences are definitely there. One more question. Uh, do you recommend the usage of tenlegliptin 40 milligram in a day? See, that depends on the individual patient. The recommendation is definitely there, but it's not for every patient. 
20 mg, we get all the advantages of a gliptin. 10 leg gliptin, 20 mg OD will give you that advantage. And so 40 mg, normally we don't give. I have given for few of the patients, but the effect is will not be very, very statistically significant or clinically significant. It's OD. It's OD. That's the advantage. That's the advantage. So how much uh, HbA1c reduction beyond that 20 milligram you get? No, that is again individual. I don't think we can have some marker yeah. like that. From 20 to 40 is equal to, you know, 0.5 of yeah. A1c reduction. We can't say that. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, you can, you can definitely combine permutation combinations, but it's, it's case by case basis. See, the guidelines does not tell you to combine these combinations, etc. There is now with uh, remogliflozin, metformin, combinations, all that we use. But definitely, case by case basis, we can take a call. But now, pyoglutazone, I think DeFranzo is promoting uh, uh, with a gliptin, SGLT2, and a pyo is his uh, favorite uh, triple drug combination. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. a wonderful lecture. So, I request my co chair <laughs> to introduce our next speaker. And uh, he doesn't require a slide. He doesn't require any introduction, per se. Uh, so, we invite Dr. Uh, Jayan Panda, professor and head of the uh, uh, PG Department of Medicine, uh, SCB Co Medical College, Kattak, Odisha. Uh, a, a huge and a big CV, a national president, the CCDSI, chair, chairman, API, Odisha State chair, uh, Branch, governing body member of National API. Organizing Secretary RSSDI 2017. Uh, he has multiple international publications and national publications, and he's a principal investigator in many of these same national and international trials. He'll be speaking today on uh, remogliflozin, one of the uh, kind of a late entry, but took a, a good amount of uh, share from the rest of the gl uh, gliflozins that we know of. So, over to Dr. Jain Panda. Thank you for that uh, nice introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, participating in our own uh, Diabetes India with fond memory of uh, Dr. Shadi Kot. And I must thank Dr. Bean, Dr. Bansi, and the whole team for a great show post-COVID. And uh, just pre-COVID, we had a session in Bangalore. And after that, everything closed, I remember. And after COVID, again, we started with Diabetes India. So today's topic uh, that have been assigned is on uh, effect of remogliflozin on glycemic variability, the remit GV trial. Uh, before that, uh, have a timer. Okay, and I'll just take 18 minutes. That's all. <laughs> so uh, effect of uh, remogliflozin on glycemic variability. The most important concept comes the monitoring of the blood glucose. Initially, we were doing early in days, one month, the blood sugar. Then came the concept of A1C, the three months average sugar we knew. And then came the most important self-monitoring of the blood glucose when we did a testing by patient himself or by the paramedical workers. And recently, we were showing the uh, CGM or uh, AGM and we are doing ambulatory glucose monitoring hour to hour, day to day, week to week, month to month and along with the long existing A1C we are moving on to this glycemic monitoring which is ambulatory which is continuous gives an impression on different time of the day. So uh, regarding the drugs we have many newer drugs and one of the newer SGLT2 inhibitor is remogliflozin. And we know the remogliflozin is given twice a day and in this dosing, what happens to the glycemic variability, postprandial hyperglycemia, 
in uh, Indian type 2 diabetes patients is a big challenge and this study comes as first of its kind for this evaluation, the Remit GV trial. We'll have a look on this, but before that, the glycemic variability and postprandial hyperglycemia, especially in the Indian setting, I'll touch upon. So, already I have told that this fluctuation has to be minimum, this day-to-day, uh, hour-to-hour -hour fluctuation, and we determine the time and range, the mean amplitude of glycemic excursion, the uh, coefficient of uh, variation to detect that. And you can see this picture where two subjects, subject 1 and subject 2, with A1C8, the fluctuations are very high in the first subject, whereas the second subject has a very narrow fluctuation. And more hypo and hyperglycemia in the first subject. But from a A1C, you cannot know that the patient has undergone this much of variation. That's why the the glycemic variability came into picture and gaining popularity. You heard the uh, previous lecture by Dr. L. Srinivas Murthy related to that. So, when the variability is less, less is the micro and macrovascular complications, increased cardiovascular events are controlled, and all the autonomic dysfunctions, the uh, severe hypoglycemia risk all come down. So, that we have to keep in our mind. And during this postprandial hyperglycemia, every meal a patient comes, it comes with a big wave of blood glucose resulting in oxidative stress. And that ultimately leads to endothelial dysfunction, smooth muscle proliferation, and cardiovascular events. So, our purpose is to avoid the postprandial hyperglycemia, avoid this glycemic excursions, and this variability have to be kept in range. Regarding meal pattern, all of you know about your patient's diet, that the last 50 years, the Indian diet has not changed. It's, it's carbohydrate, carbohydrate, and carbohydrate. In average, we get almost 64 to 65 percent carbohydrate in our diet, and protein hardly 15 to 20 percent, uh, so also the fat. So that results in a very high postprandial or glycemic excursion. This is the start study by Professor Shashank Joshi et al. And this shows in type 2 diabetes and non-type 2 diabetes group, there is no much difference. The carbohydrate intake are almost equal and it's 64.1 percent of total energy from carbohydrate source. And the meal pattern affects the glycemic variability including postprandial excursion because patients having carbohydrate have a very high glycemic excursion. And this study has studied the postprandial blood glucose. This has been tried in two important drugs. One is remogliflozin, the SGLD2 inhibitor, which has been launched uh, recently, and the depagliflozin, the older one, which is given uh, once daily. And this is assessed by the CGM, the continuous glucose monitoring in the Indian patients of type 2 diabetes. In nutshell, I am telling about uh, the study rational that all of you know that uh, this uh, remogliflozin is twice daily and uh, dipagliflozin is once daily and it has been compared in phase 3 study of remogliflozin. But being twice daily, its effect on the glycemic variability show also the postprandial hyperglycemia was checked and the study was conducted to evaluate the effect and compare with the dipagliflozin show also the adverse effects of the drug. And the primary and the secondary objects, as I told, was taken with uh, two groups and uh, four centers have conducted uh, around uh, 33 patients of remogliflozin and 32 patients of depagliflozin. This is the inclusion criteria in uh, adults with uh, A1C729 with a stable uh, therapy, metformin monotherapy or dual therapy with gliptine, the random blood glucose less than 300 because Above that, we take, give insulin and a compliant uh, dietary regimen for more than six weeks prior to screening was ta uh, taken. And the usual uh, factors like decay, the arrhythmias, the uh, uh, GFR uh, coming down, acute infection, they are all uh, uh, ruled out. So the CGM device implanted on day one, the remote APA introduced from the day five onwards, 
CGM device removed on the day 15 and uh, remote APA continued. Again, new CGM device was put on day 33. The CGM device continued for 14 days and uh, removed on the day 47. So this was a total day 1 to day 46 trial and the first CGM and second CGM uh, was done on 1 to 4, 5 to 14 and 33 to 46 in phase 1 and phase 2. And the baseline data was taken on the first 5 days and the apagliflozin and demoglyphlozin uh, related issues were ensured. So this is the study flow with the parameters as you see the A's, sex, BMI, duration all uh, matching and A1C, the mean glucose, time in range, the um, um, mean uh, postprandial glycemic excursion uh, coming in a different way. But this, has, this is not statistically significant. The comparison of the glycemic parameters from the baseline to phase 1, you will see there are few parameters, the green one uh, uh, statistically significant in this mean glucose, mean amplitude of glycemic excursion, coefficient of variation, as well as mean postprandial glycemic excursion, the red one are not. So here, all this data of both the drugs, where some were significant, some were not significant statistically, were analyzed and compared, and the glycemic parameter values from baseline to phase two were seen uh, taking this criteria. So if you take TIR, there is no significance in the both the groups. Both have uh, tried to maintain it. A significant improvement but no uh, significant difference in the uh, improvement uh, observed between the remo and the DAPA. and here the baseline to phase two uh, trial if we'll see in the remo the there was statistically significant uh, reduction uh, the glycemic parameters in breakfast lunch uh, and the dinner the postprandial uh, one hour postprandial two hour uh, all three were statistically significant against the dapagliflozin not coming out. So the mean overall meal time change in the mean postprandial glycemic excursion from baseline to phase two, if you will see here, the, uh, the, the, the all three in uh, postprandial one hour, if you will see the statistical significance come uh, in uh, few and uh, only in dinner time, the dapagliflozin data is statistically significant. And the mean change in postprandial one hour from baseline to phase two again uh, has the, uh, the the star one. You can see the breakfast, lunch, and dinner with uh, remogliflozin is uh, significant, but in DAPA it was not significant at any point of time. So me overall meal time change in the postprandial two hour from baseline to phase two. This is also again the uh, data comes all break, uh, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner in uh, the uh, remogliflozin, whereas uh, in the DAPA group, it's breakfast and dinner and lunch is not there. So few are included and few are not included here. And the mean change is in continuous glycemic profile across 24 hours, if we'll see, uh, from the baseline to phase two, the more reduction seen with the remogliflozin compared to uh, dapagliflozin, especially in night time. The, the nocturnal blood glucose with remogliflozin treated patients were significantly uh, low uh, in contrast to the dapagliflozin patients. So here, if we put the postprandial picks like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and put the uh, remogliflozin curve, the dosing in the postprandial glucose control, uh, the mechanism may be that in twice daily dosing, we are getting a better control uh, taking pics of the glycemic excursion that results in a statistically significant control of the glycemic variability and postprandial excursions. So the conclusions which were taken in this randomized active control open level study of six weeks duration to evaluate, the, compare the glycemic parameters and the remogliflozin compared to depagliflozin using 24 hours continuous glucose monitoring Three important things we can conclude here. One is a significant improvement in TIR and A1C levels with both the groups, but no difference between the groups here. We didn't get any statistically significant group between dapagliflozin and remogliflozin. Second most important thing is the significant improvement in postprandial glycemic parameters where mean postprandial glycemic excursion, postprandial one hour and two hour with remogliflozin, but non-significant with dapagliflozin. Specifically, the postprandial excursion is not there with dapagliflozin. 
And third, there is significant improvement in postprandial glycemic parameters at almost every meal, that is breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and eight out of nine are very well regulated in the REMO group, whereas the uh, fewer, that is three out of nine, are controlled with the DAPA group. And di similar adverse events are found in both the group. So with this, I can summarize that the glycemic variability control in terms of both long-term parameters like A1C and short-term parameters like time and range, the coefficient of variation, the mean postprandial glycemic adjustment should be the main objective of anti-diabetic therapy. If you have not practiced, I, I'm sure that many of you have practiced because there is no much change uh, or the technical challenge in a small setup to practice this. So this is a very uh, scientific, very simple, and with a, a simple Libre Pro, you can uh, put the monitoring and know up to 14 days glycemic variability. You can keep for three days, five days, 10 days, 14 days, like that. And the postprandial hyperglycemia is independent of risk factors for CVD and has shown to further increase the risk of CV events in diabetic patient. So we have to target minimizing the glycemic variability as well as postprandial hyperglycemia in these patients. And the Indian meal pattern has high carbohydrate meal per day, contributing to more postprandial hyperglycemia. That also all of us know and has been proved and is fixed for last almost 50 years time. So this study, I'll take two conclusions before I end. The remogliflozin and dapagliflozin have both showed similar significant improvement in glycemic variability parameters like A1C, time in range, and the uh, coefficient of variation. But for postprandial glycemic parameters like mean postprandial glycemic excursion, first and second hour postprandial uh, uh, blood glucose, the improvement was significant with remogliflozin, but not with dapagliflozin. And significant improvement in almost every meal, that is breakfast, lunch, and dinner, was found with remogliflozin, but a few meal time with dapagliflozin. So from this, we can conclude that maybe because of its twice daily dosing, the excursions and postprandial picks are better controlled with this study, the remit GV shows. So what we are thinking that giving this drug twice a day has some challenges of dosing and the patient compliance has come as an advantage here to assure our patients glycemic excursion control and postprandial blood glucose control, which in long term result in prevention of the micro and macrovascular complications and also a good metabolic memory. Thank you for the attention and we can take questions. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful lecture. If you have any question in the audience. Who is around the two hours, it is four hours. Uh, in, in all the international trials and uh, the uh, all the phases of the clinical trials, this has been used as uh, twice daily only. So uh, three times uh, with their extra advantages uh, are not come across. I don't know if somebody has uh, gone through. Nowhere uh, the as per the pharmacokinetics only. Twice a day, twice, twice a day. In all the trials, they have advocated twice a day. But sir, reverse is true in India that yeah. once in a day usage is more common yeah, in yeah, India. Yeah, yeah. Or the, 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 the compliance half, is much much yeah. better because patient is not only on anti-diabetic drugs. He is on anti-hypertensive, on a lipid lowering, on a with a antioxidant, maybe with a thyroxine, maybe with a hyperuric acid drug. So uh, with this uh, polypharmacy, uh, the compliance is better is in once a day. That's why. So much of extended release, sustained release, uh, combination peels, coming up. they come up. But this is the advantage that we get uh, here, uh, comparing the once daily SGLT2 inhibitor and twice daily SGLT2 inhibitor. That um, Same with gliptin also. Once daily gliptins are more preferred, but uh, maybe uh, they have to be seen regarding their glycemic excursion. Here the once daily, uh, all Ocana, uh, DAPA and EMPA, we are giving once daily, but Remo twice daily, but here this study has a clear evidence of statistically significant decrease in the variability as well as the postprandial excursion 
in view of the Indian type 2 diabetes patients with high carbohydrate intake, which is not true with our western part. They have almost half of uh, the carbohydrate load than that of ours. Sir, in your opinion, which is the better molecule, DPP-4 or the SGLT-2 for the controlling this glycemic variability? Uh, we have used both the drugs very rampantly and uh, both profile are different. DPP-4 is a, I'll tell, benign drug. It doesn't have much side effects. Very silently it does its work. And Shefty profile is very high, DPP-4. The uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are extraordinary uh, drugs in the form of cardiorenal protection. Besides A1C, both dose A1C reduction, besides that this is pleiotropic effect is very good and if you think of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or patient of DKD, early DKD, uh, you, you have to give SGL2 inhibitor and GLP-1 uh, as a preventive measure as per the recent guidelines. You asked regarding the glycemic excursion. You see, glycemic excursion uh, is controlled once the blood glucose first thing postprandial comes down and, and, and around the clock uh, it, it is maintained uh, through that, through that range, time in range. So regarding the glycemic control, it doesn't have much uh, variation if it's properly combined with other drugs and as per the A1C and first thing postprandial, the uh, uh, doses are suited to keep the blood glucose between uh, say 130, 140 uh, first thing and 170, 180 postprandial. But regarding the pleiotropic effect, SGLD2 inhibitors have an advantage. But at the same time, you have to be careful regarding the uh, all issues which are coming. Uh, um, uh, li like the euglycemic uh, ketoacidosis, like the uh, genitourinary infections, like uh, now the fasciitis and the um, ponyous gangrene. There are many things starting from the gangrene to ketoacidosis, they are coming up. But in my practice, with proper instruction of genital hygiene and good fluid therapy, and not a single case of any of this side effects because only thing you have to spend little time with the patient telling about the precautions and 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 there, there are no drug I'll, I'll tell two best groups of drugs now in anti-diabetic re regimen are the glp1 agonist and the uh, uh, sglt2 inhibitor active Active, active metabolite. Active. Pharmacologically active metabolite, they also uh, uh, contribute and pro drug which we tell, they also uh, uh, decide the doses pattern. Please come and tell about the, the benefits of DAPA and being about the same thing about Remo. We know it appears to be a class effect. How do we, I mean, for all of us, how do how do we answer this sometimes when we also take lectures, we are asked the same question. Yeah. So how do we answer this particular uh, aspect? Yeah, uh, this is a very common query in a doctor's mind. Here I'll tell, uh, you see, uh, whoever, like my previous speaker was, was telling about teneligliptin. You see, uh, cetagliptin, vildagliptin has many more trials in their favor in comparison to the gliptins which are relatively launched later. So if you tell uh, Kenna, Dapar, Empa, there are a lot many CBOTs and trials in their favor. Remo has relatively come later to the market. So in view of that, the studies are less, but there is definitely class effect. There is definitely affordability for Indian patients. Now uh, there are few drugs are getting off patent and coming to the market. That's a different issue. But initially when this drug was launched, that was only afforded uh, gliflozin by many. So that makes a drug studied very elaborately and we can have more publications in favor of that. But uh, uh, happened with the teneligliptin. Teneligliptin became the most prescribed gliptin world over because of Indian patients and because of affordability. So similar scope was there, but by this time few gliptins have become off patent and they, they are becoming available at the similar range, so they have become competitors. So more we use, more we will know about the molecule. And definitely there is uh, cardio-renal protection of remocliflozin at par with other established gliflozins 
like uh, EMPA and like uh, uh, DAPA and also KANA. Yes, sir. Any questions? Yeah, that that happens. That happens. Actually, maybe here it shows in comparison to dapagliflozin, better glycemic control by the uh, remogliflozin group in the night also. Nocturnal reduction is also good. That may be because of the drug levels, which has been taken in the uh, second dose, maybe uh, post-launch uh, dose, which controls the night uh, blood glucose. So maybe that part in the elderly patient also to be instructed properly. Sometimes, yeah. so, so basically, uh, uh, regarding it is SGLT2 inhibitors, the moment your glycemic uh, uh, range comes below 160, 180, 160, the, the uh, chances of polyuria reduces because then, the, uh, anyway, the threshold if your gl blood glucose levels go below the threshold, the, uh, the chances of polyuria is less. The osmotic so symptoms over, are less. Over the period of time, uh, sometimes what you're saying is right. I mean, we do have to tell the patients that one the once the glucose levels start dropping down, these symptoms might reduce. You have to take Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot, Dr. Jain. Thank Pranda. you. Thank you. And uh, so the last session today over here for the basics, uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Shanmuga Velau. Uh, he's a consultant diabetologist. Uh, from, uh, he finished his MBBS from Madras University and MD also from Madras University. He's an FRCP, Glasgow, UK, FICP from Indian College of Physicians. Uh, he has a lot of, uh, a huge CV as, as usual. Everyone knows him as a te good teacher and uh, has presented papers in various forums as well as participated in various clinical trials as well. So we all know that uh, what we eat does cause changes in your blood, blood glucose level. He's here to talk about uh, gut microbiota uh, and diabetes.
respected chairpersons, co-speakers, senior doctors and my doctor friends, I feel extremely happy, honored and most privileged to have been uh, invited to make a presentation on diabetes and gut microbiota with a particular focus on outcomes. I thank uh, Dr. Bansi Sabu and Manoj Chawla for their kind invitation. So my disclosures, what I'm going to do for another 20 minutes. So first introduction. So eukaryocytes, bacteria, and archaea residing in the gut, they are collectively known as the gut microbiota. Uh, inclusion of gut environment and the inhabiting microbial genome, it represents the gut microbiome in which bacteria are the major constraints in the gut. Several studies identified that changes in the quantity and diversity of gut microbiota have significant importance with reference to progression of many metabolic disorders. So human gut microbiota, it provides protection against pathogens, also improves the immune system. They also play a crucial role in maintaining the intestinal integrity, homeostasis of gut epithelium, as well as metabolizing the xenobiotics, including the drugs. So adjunct therapy with a probiotic like lactobacillus. It's It's not appearing here. It's not moving. Uh, it's moving slowly. Uh, so I have gone through already. All uh, right. So adjunct therapy with the probiotic, that is live beneficial common cell bacteria species like Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium has been in use for a long time. In addition to probiotics, resistant fibers that promote the growth of beneficial bacteria they're known as prebiotics. This biosis can cause uh, numerous diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, and can also lead to metabolic diseases like obesity, diabetes, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So microbiota. In 2001, Joshua Lederberg, a former Nobel Prize winner, first defined the human microbiome as an ecological community, common cell, symbiotic, and pathogenic microorganisms that collectively share our body space. Human health is strongly influenced by microbiota. An adult human is colonized by approximately 100 million microbes, predominantly in the gastrointestinal tract, of which the largest population resides in the colon. Rodents and humans differ in certain aspects of the physiology, but animal models they provide valuable opportunities to conduct investigations. In the vast majority of gut microbiota, they belong to four main families, namely Firmicutes, Bacteroidetes, Proteobacteria, and Actinobacteria. And of course, we have the smaller but relevant phyla. So under normal physiological conditions, Firmicutes constitute nearly 64%, Bacteroidetes nearly 23%, so both together constitute nearly 90%, Proteobacteria 8% and Actinobacteria 3%. Evidence suggests that gut bacteria can influence human health either directly or indirectly, and disruption can may increase the prevalence of obesity, type 2 diabetes, arthritis, eye cancer, etc. According to this particular author, the microbiota community differences between the participant cohorts. So normal physiological conditions, I told you, 90%, it is contributed predominantly by firmicutes and bacteroidetes. With the onset of type 2 diabetes, with reference to type 2 diabetes cohort, 90% is contributed by firmicutes and bacteroidetes. But a very important thing is there is a change in the ratio between the bacteroidetes as well as the firmicutes ratio. So the interaction between the human body and the intestinal microflora appears to start at birth. The development of mi microbiome it goes through three fundamental stages, namely the developmental stage, transition stage, as well as a stable period. And 90% of the bacterial species, they present in the gut of the adult, adults. So depending upon the anatomy, abiotic environment, and diversified functions of the different parts, the microbial composition may also broadly differ. 
so a healthy adult hoppers several colony forming units in the whole gut with a mass weight of about 1 to 2 kg the colon alone, alone contains 109 to 100,012 colony forming, form, forming units followed by jejunum as well as ileum. So if you look into the transfer of microbiota, it takes place in the utero or during birth, they achieve stability around two years of age. So in addition to genetics and environmental factors, early exposure to microbes during birth plays an important role. So exposure to vaginal microbiome during delivery, skin mi microbiota during cesarean section, and antibiotics in neonatal and early childhood play a significant role in shaping the stable gut microbiome. Next is gut microbiota and its functions. So main physiological functions are for digestion, absorption, enhanced host immune, development of immune cells, biological antagonism, anti-tumor response, and also helps in the synthesis of beneficial compounds, harvesting energy, that is very important, as well as vitamin synthesis. Once the gut microbiota is out of balance, series of disease will be series of disease will be would be induced so first is regarding the short chain fat acids namely acetate propionate and butyrate they are a metabolite produced primarily by the intestinal bacteria to metabolize dietary fibers so we have the complex polysaccharides they are digested and they are degraded and they were fermented by the microbacteria resulting in the generation of short chain fat acids and that short chain fat acid plays an important role in metabolizing the dietary fibers. So short chain fat acids, they affect the glucose metabolism and insulin sensitivity by stimulating the secretion of peptide YY as well as glucagon-like peptide 1, increase the intestinal gluconeogenesis, they enhance the glucose uptake peripherally by increasing the expression of glucose transporter 4 and in skeletal muscles, they reduce the glycolysis leading to greater glycogen synthesis. Next is energy supply. It accounts for nearly 9 to 10, 5 to 10 percent of total energy consumption in normal colon, especially butyrate. It also maintains the integrity of the intestinal barrier by increasing the expression of the transcription factors. There are many tight junction proteins which are upregulated and which are overexpressed when the butyrate generation is on the higher side. And it also maintains the intestinal anaerobic environment because butyrate activates the paper gamma in colon cells and as well as drives the energy metabolism. It also prevents the abnormal proliferation of opportunistic pathogen. So in that way, the dietary fibers play an important role. Next is enhanced immunity. So butyrate has anti-inflammatory effect by promoting the production of regulatory T cells. They have the ability to activate the parasympathetic activity promotes glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. It has a capacity to cross the blood-brain barrier, leading to the enhancement of expression of various neuropeptides. Next is indole propionic acid. It is a, derived from the bacterial aromatic acid metabolism or catabolism. It is highly correlated with the dietary fiber intake. It provides potent radical scavenging property. That is, it possesses antioxidative capacity and it may also provide protection of the pancreatic beta cell from damage associated with the metabolic and oxidative stress. Next is bile acids. They are secreted in the intestine. They are converted into secondary bile acids. So bile acids converted into primary, secondary. These secondary bile acids are normally metabolized by the gut microbiota. In that, they stimulate the FXR, that is foreign X receptor, and leads to the release, it leads to improvement with reference to insulin sensitivity. They also activate the TGA or 5 receptor, promoting muscle energy consumption and causes altered structure function and stability of intestinal flora. And recent studies shown that the metabolism of bile acid is abnormal in a patient with a gut microbial dysbiosis. And that increased secretion of secondary bile acids such as lithocholic and deoxycholic acid plays an important role in that it stimulates the release of hydroxytryptamine from enterochromaffin cells, resulting in reduced insulin release as well as enhanced glucagon secretion. So that is very important. So bile acids play an important role. Next is lipopolysaccharide. High levels of serum lipopolysaccharides are mainly produced by gram-negative bacteria and they play an important role in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes in that it recognizes the toll-like receptor, number one. It also activates 
the nuclear factor kappa b inflammatory signaling pathway characterized by increased circulating levels of the inflammatory, inflammatory markers or the cytokines and beta cells are damaged by the inhibited insulin secretion mediated by down regulated expression of the pdx1 gene next is branched-chain amino acids they are primarily synthesized by the host they are not cannot be synthesized by the host must be obtained from the diet and elevated plasma levels of bcc bca it's a risk factor for type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance and it is closely related to the mtard signaling pathway and it also increases the oxidation of free fat acids and also activation of the phosphoinositol 3 kinase pathway next is imidazole propionate it's a product of histidine metabolism which affects get, uh, 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 glucose metabolism through MTRC signaling pathway. This propionate increased in pre-diabetes as well as in patients with the type 2 diabetes and they are possibly correlated with reference to systemic inflammation. Next is gastrointestinal barrier function. It plays a preventative barrier to various powerful harmful substances playing an integral role in the regulation of the immune system. And very important thing, patient with the type 2 diabetes, there is a significant enhanced permeability. This alteration in the permeability leads to transflocation of the bacterial, bacterial flora and from the gut epithelium, resulting in metabolic endotoxemia and it ultimately leads to low-grade inflammation. So this lipopolysaccharide plays an important role in chronic low-grade inflammation, which is associated with the patient with the type 2 diabetes with an impact on the insulin resistance. So type 2 diabetes characterized by chronic low-grade inflammation with abnormal expression as well as production of numerous inflammatory mediators. So individuals who have reduced amounts of butate producing microbe, they are, they, it results in low-grade inflammation in the gut, which in turn ultimately results in insulin resistance and through the activity of lipoprotein, I mean lip lipopolysaccharide, which is an essential component derived from the gram-negative bacteria. So this lipopolysaccharide recognizes toll-like receptor. They activate the nuclear factor kappa B and ultimately resulting in increased circulating levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the activation of the serum kinases, in turn, it, it affects the intercellular insulin signaling pathway. So the release of pro-inflammatory cytokine disrupts glucose metabolism as well as insulin signaling. In the long term, it has been associated with defective gene transcription of various intercellular insulin signaling pathways. So the main mechanism between gut microbiota and type 2 diabetes. We have the dietary fiber, its positive impact. We have the bile acids, which are converted into primary and secondary bile acids. Next, we have the histidine, which is converted into imidazole propionic acid. And we have the gram-negative bacteria, which results in the generation of lipopolysaccharide. So next is gut microbiota and carbohydrate metabolism. So protection of metabolites during fermentation of the microbial action on the various food. The resulting secondary effects include activation of the inflammatory cascades, disruption of the permeability of the intestinal mucosal barrier, and direct signaling action through insulin secretion. So patient with the type 2, they demonstrate an environment in that it predominantly affects the transport of glucose, branched-chain amino acid transportation, methane metabolism, as well as xenobiotic degradation and metabolism, as well as sulfate reduction. The same cohort displayed reduced levels of bacterial chemotaxis, flagellar assembly, butate biosynthesis, metabolism of the cofactors, as well as vitamins. So the microbiota, influence of glucose metabolism. We have the metabolites, namely short-chain fat acids, branched-chain amino acids, indole, as well as imidazole, and inflammation. There is excess of lipopolysaccharide. Next is we have the bile acid converted into primary as well as secondary bile acids. And we have the gastrointestinal tract mucosa where the bacterial permeability plays an integral part in maintaining the integrity of the epithelium. Next is role of diet in shaping the gut flora. So diet is a crucial regulator of intestinal microflora. Flora. The composition of the microbial community ecosystem, it is always dynamic. It is dependent upon many factors, and the gut microbiota is easily altered by dietary changes. We can see changes within 24 hours. It is also a vital regulator of gut microbiota. The composition also varies with an individual's age, 
and varying compositions of the gut microorganism has been identified in different geographical regions and they may also be related to different regional eating habits. There are evidences to confirm that consumption of the animal derived food leads to the adaptation of the gut microbial function towards increased catabolic process. So there is an alteration with reference to microbial changes, namely there is increased prevalence of bacteria trees, in contrast diet rich in plant which favors the growth of the pre water love. And that plant derived foods, the gut microbiota produce more saturated fat, enzymes involved in anabolism and there is increased synthesis of various enzymes. So it is anabolic. On the other hand, the animal derived foods, it's always catabolic. So if you look into this particular diagram, it clearly shows the plant material rich diet. It raises, it alters the microbial uh, flora and that it is associated with increased generation of short chain fat acids. And very important thing is it also plays an impo Im important role with reference to immune homeostasis, insulin sensitivity, and maintains the gut integral activity. Next is animal product on the other hand. It induces changes with reference to microbial flora and there is reduced generation of short chain fat acids and it is catabolic and associated with the increased circulating levels of inflammatory molecules that alters the back, uh, in intestinal uh, permeability as well as the integrity leading to metabolic endotoxemia and inflammation. So the schematic view of gut microbiota under healthy and disease conditions. So under healthy conditions, the gut permeability is intact, the tight junction proteins are upregulated, no change in the intestinal microbiome. In patients who are eating lot of animal food, there is an alteration with reference to gut permeability, alteration with reference to tight junction protein and changes in the intestinal and microbiome. And very important thing is there is activation of the cannabinoid receptor one also. And changes in the gut microbiome due to the use of clinically important antibiotics. So antibiotics can alter the microbial <coughs> flora. So the interplay between diet and the gut microbiome with reference to healthy condition, with reference to diabetic conditions, patient with the type 1 as well as patient with the type 2. So let us look into gut microbiota and its relation to diabetes. So type 1 diabetes. Both type 1 type 2 are associated with the complex immune system and gut microbiome interactions. So the gut microbiota preclinical type 1 patients characterized by dominance of bacteria that is lack of butyric acid producing bacteria with low stability and diversity of intestinal flora. The concept that pathogenesis of type 1 that is affected by gut microbiota has been well established only in animal models but human studies on the microbiome in type 1 are still low. So human studies clearly showed that acetate diet reduces the frequency of autoimmune T cells Butyrate diet increases the number and function of the regulatory T cells. Uh, the unlike type 2 diabetes, cancer of whole microbiome may not reduce the incidence of type 1. Next is the development of type 1 has been linked to aberrant intestinal and microbiota. Next is with reference to type 2. So majority of the studies reported association between specific taxa as well as the disease or its phenotypes and changes with reference to inflammation as well as changes with reference to other gut permeability. So first is the microbial genera, most frequently found to be associated with the type 2. So shown in blue, that is, post, uh, that is negatively associated or correlated, shown in red, positively correlated with the reference to increased prevalence of type 2 diabetes. So the potential mechanism of microbiota, its effect on metabolism of a metabolism in patient with the type 2. It modulates inflammation, interacts with the dietary constituents, it affects the gut permeability, the glucose lipid metabolism, insulin sensitivity as well as overall energy homeostasis. So overall type 2 diabetes is associated with the elevated levels of pro-inflammatory markers. So these markers and lipopolysaccharide, they are recognized by the toll like receptors and very important thing is if you look into the interleukin 22, it has anti-inflammatory cytokine which can restore the insulin sensitivity and also inhibits the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And increased intestinal permeability is a characteristic feature of patient with the type 2. It results in translocation of the gut microbial products, ultimately resulting in metabolic endotoxemia as well as low-grade inflammations. And probiotic bacterium, 
decreases gut permeability and very important thing is it causes upregulation of the intestinal tight junction proteins via several mechanisms. So, butate produced by certain bacterial microbe also have potential to reduce the gut permeability through serotonin transporters as well as PPAR gamma pathways. This role varies mechanistic pathways that results in the increased susceptibility to develop type 2 diabetes. It also affects type 2 by influencing glucose metabolism. Very important thing is the bifidobacterium can increase glycogen synthesis. It can also improve the translocation of glucose transporter 4 as well as insulin stimulated glucose uptake. And very important thing is it has a potential anti-diabetic effect and also upregulates the genes which are often associated with the various intercellular insulin signaling cascade protein transcription factors. It also decreases the insulin degrading enzyme and increases the adiponectin levels in patients with uh, when, uh, when lactobacillus are given. Next is some species of lactobacilli and acarmensia. They possess potent alpha glucose synthase inhibitory activity and the microbiote can modulate gut hormones and enzymes. They improve insulin resistance as well as the glucose tolerance. So, bifidobacterium and lactobacillus produce bile salts hydrolysis and secondary bile acids in turn activate the membrane bile acid receptor to induce the production of GLP-1. Next is fatty acid oxidation. Very important thing is fatty acid oxidation as well as energy expenditure. They reduce the synthesis of fatty acid am ameliorates obesity and consequently patient with the type 2 diabetes. And that acarmensia and bacteroids, lactobacillus, they have been reported to increase fatty acid oxidation in adipose tissue and shown to reduce the obesity by increasing fatty acid oxidation genes. So, not only promotes fatty acid uptake oxidation, but also it, it upregulates the genes responsible for fatty acid oxidation. So, the main mechanism of gut microbiota affecting insulin resistance and diabetes is shown in this particular slide with reference to microbe lipopolysaccharide, bile acid metabolism, as well as TGF4 pathway. Therapies for type 2 diabetes based on gut microbiota. So, diet rich in complex carbohydrates. The very important thing is they reduce inflammation, can increase the diversity of gut microbiota and can enrich the short chain fatty acid producing bacteria and prevent the growth of harmful bacteria and they increase insulin and A1C levels in patients with the diabetes. Very important exercise. So, the studies have shown abundance of bacteroids increased after exercise training while the abundance of clostridium genus and other microbes are very much decreased. Next is probiotics. They generally gram positive bacteria. They are defined as live microorganisms. They also play an important role. And that meta analysis of clinical trials showed probiotics could effectively reduce fasting, fasting insulin, as well as A1C and improve the efficacy of HOMA IR. Next is we have the prebiotics. That is the food components such as indigestible polysaccharides or fiber that beneficially affect the host by stimulating the growth or activity of one of the limited intestinal microbe. Likewise, a mixture of pro and pre, we have the symbiotics. Next is FMT, that is fecal microbiota transplantation. After six months weeks of treatment, the insulin sensitivity is significantly improved and including the butate producing bacteria, the population also increased. So, anti-diabetic drugs, metformin, it inhibits the growth of the B fragilis by modifying the metabolism of folic acid, increases the secretion of GLP-1 and regulates glucose metabolism. It also increases the abundance of probiotics. And acarbose complete acts in the intestine which may partially affect the composition of distal mic microflora. So, conclusion, it plays an important role in type 2 diabetes by exerting effects both in composition and function and degrees of butate producing bacteria and reduction of butyrate are common in patients with the type 2. Several factors associated with the gut microbiota have been elucidated in patients with the type 2 diabetes with reference to short chain fat acids, bile acid metabolism, lipopolysaccharide, Bernstein amino acids and imidazole propionate and gut microbiota not only be used as diagnostic biomarker but a potential therapeutic target for type 2 and elucidation of the precise role and 
mechanism of gut microbiota um, in type 2 will provide novel insights into developing individual therapy for type 2 diabetes. So before I conclude, on behalf of the organizing committee of RSSD 2022, I invite all of our participants to attend this RSSD 2022, going to be conducted on October 6, 7, 8, 9 in Chennai and make this a memorable event. Thank you very much for their kind listening. Thank, thanks a lot, sir. I mean, it was a true uh, classroom lecture encompassing, I think, all physio, biochem, patho, and, and I, I don't know, I mean, a lot of things. You did uh, mention about uh, uh, animal products consumption versus uh, yes, plant-based Yes, animal products thing. versus plant-derived. Kind yes. of almost scared those who are non-vegetarians over here. But uh, a, a simple uh, one-line uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, suggestion for our patients, what should they have so that their uh, gut microbiota is not... Uh, so the thing is, taking non-veg meal is not, absolu not absolutely contraindicated. But you can take limited quantity along with the plant-derived foods in plenty. If you take plant-derived foods, definitely it will restore the microbial uh, composition with reference to quantity as well as diversity and that this complex polysaccharide undergoes generation of short-chain fatty acids. This short-chain fatty acid plays an important role with, with reference to maintenance of the intestinal barrier, integrity of the intestinal epithelium. And very important thing is it also plays an important role indirectly with reference to glucose metabolism as well as energy harvesting. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, yes, sir, uh, Vinay. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a very relevant question, but the thing is that as far as the data is concerned, only limited. And these trials are conducted only in a, sh uh, a small number of patients, only for a short period of time. And there are no definite markers, number two. Third important thing is if you look into the results, the results are encouraging. So I will say it's an emerging field, emerging field, not of any particular uh, data to say this will definitely. But as of now, the recommendation is if you follow a meal plan, in such a way, we take the meal, which may not be, may not alter the microbial uh, composition, then it will be beneficial. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. yes. No. Uh, as of now, the recommendation is only with reference to the food not with reference to the formulations that are being manufactured and promoted by the pharma company. No, no. So yogurt, it's a very good eh, probiotic, no problem at all. Fermented, mi fermented milk is a very good. It's also miso, right. Next is fermented vegetables like cucumber, fermented vegetables like onion, radish, cauliflower. They provide very good eh, pre as well as probiotic. Lime juice with honey. It provides very good pre as well as probiotic. No, <laughs> we should, we should, we should uh, ferment it in a proper manner, proper way, proper way. Yes. So oh, thank you, Vinay. You are next, actually. So thanks a lot, sir. And thank you very thank much you for the amazing lecture. Over to uh, Dhruvi Hasnani and uh, Dr. Vaibodu. Yeah. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we've had a very, very fantastic session on the basics of diabetes and all of us are almost, you know, up after a little, um, let, let's not call it a slumber. So now we have a very dynamic technology session, diabetes and technology, and we have even more dynamic lectures coming up with very vibrant speakers. So now I'll request Dr. Vaibhav Dukle, sir, to introduce our very first speaker. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Uh, Maluk Mohammed.
Uh, he's going to uh, speak on the reversal of diabetes using whole body twin technology. He's a doctor. He has a doctorate degree from IIT uh, Madras. He has guided around 13 uh, PhD research scholars uh, with uh, multiple patents on uh, health technology. He heads the India operations for the company. And uh, prior to find founding Twin Health, he played an important role in transforming the higher education space in Tamil Nadu. Uh, with this brief introduction, uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Uh, speak on this. If we have Vinay sirs ready and if you permit, can we move ahead with okay. Vinay sirs and then in the meantime resolve it? Yeah, yeah that's, that sounds comfortable. You know. Dr. Vinay Dandania, sir. So, Dr. Vinay Dandania is a consultant diabetes and metabolic physician. Uh, he is an honorable honorary diabetologist for Seva Southern and Orchid Medical Center for Ranchi. He has been the principal investigator for ICMR, MDRF, and Diab study. He's been faculty to numerous national conferences, seminars, and workshops. He is a very, very known and prestigious faculty, academician, and scientist. He has been the secretary RSSDI Jharkhand State Chapter and is an alumni ISB Hyderabad. So, Vinay sir, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Dhruvi, for that very kind introduction. And at the onset, I thank the whole team of Diabetes India for this opportunity. This is going to be a workshop on point of care testing in diabetes. And I tell you, we are doing a lot of point of care testing, not only in diabetes, but each and every field of medicine, from doing an optimal test in, for malaria, for drop T in emergencies, for NTPO, BNP. So all these things are very, very popular. So similarly in diabetes, I'm going to talk about a very relevant point of care testings. These are, this is the definition by College of American Pathologists, which defines POCT as test designed to be used at or near the site where the patient is located that do not require permanent dedicated space and that are performed outside the physical facilities of the clinical laboratories. I tell you, we can carry the devices from one clinic to another and do the point of care testing. This is the advantage of this particular process. The US FDA even similarly defines POCT A1C as a device used to measure the percentage concentration of HbA1c in blood. And the measurement of HbA1c is used as an aid in the diagnosis of diabetes and as an aid in the identification of patient at risk for developing diabetes. So we have a lot of even automated POCT devices which are available. We even have a, a recommendation from our own country. Uh, this is a very published data in 2019, which actually gives the recommendation for in-clinic POCTs for diabetes management in India. I have a couple of scenarios which we see in clinical practice. It's a very, very uh, common scenario. We get patients referred for fitness of surgeries. This was before a cataract surgery. And the patient had done a lab test two days back. And he went to the uh, ophthalmologist and said, I have come with the report. Just I uh, need my cataract surgery to be done. But the colleague of mine actually refers me for any uh, cataract surgery in a diabetic for fitness. So he was like, just give me a fitness. I have the report done two days back and nothing else. But in our clinic, we have a routine that we do a blood sugar random in our clinic before giving them a fitness. The moment blood sugar was done, it was 436. And you know what the patient commented? He said, Sir, this DBI is bad. Our sugar has been two days before. It's completely better. Then we did a HbA1c. It was 13.5%. And then we uh, again repeated his uh, urine for ketones and sugars. He was urine sugar 3 plus and ketones absent. Then I told him, you want to get operated, you get it operated. We are not going to give you fitness. So we have multiple reports which can be correlated at one time to suggest that this patient was actually keeping a 
uncontrolled diabetes and cataract surgery is not permissible, it's not safe for him. So this could be done in 10 minutes time, can you believe this? So this is the advantage of POCT. Similarly, we had a nine weeks pregnant lady, 32 year old was referred by a gynae colleague for management of her blood sugar. Now she was detected diabetic for the first time. She had a fasting of 180 and a PP of 270. Now she was in denial and not ready to accept her report. I don't have any problem today, I don't have any symptoms, how can I get sugar? Then she said, I have come from far away, I will not go from far away, I will not come from far away. Then we did a blood sugar, HbA1c and urine. In 10 minutes time we had a report. Blood sugar was 225, HbA1c was 9%, urine sugar was 1 plus and ketones were absent. She was diagnosed as a pre-existing type 2 diabetes. You know the whole prognosis of this particular case changes the moment you do a HbA1c with a normal HbA1c and with a higher HbA1c. You can actually prognosticate this lady that you are very likely to have a congenital anomaly. So these are the real world advantages of doing a POCT in your clinic and believe me they are very very simple today. So this is how it actually flows on. Patients you can actually you see patient arrives for appointment, finger prick sample has been given and they are readily available. I mean the results are ready in minutes, 7 minutes, 10 minutes, these are the minutes how you get your reports. Like you, you get a tropi report in your emergency, ABG reports in your emergency, they are all what ABG, this is nothing but a POCT. You have a small gadget in your hand to take a uh, bl arterial blood and put it there in the cartridges, you get the report. Along with electrolytes you get, you get a hematocrit. So a lot of data as you get today uh, by uh, POCT's devices. So why they are becoming popular? Because of the compactness, fast and accurate, immediate decisions you can make, improve patient care, non-laboratory personnel, uh, you don't need a trained uh, setup for it, and portability, as I said, from one clinic to another, you can carry them. Testing compliance is poor in diabetic patients. This is also very, very important to understand that uh, I heard a couple of lectures since morning. Patient ek bar aata hai, fir saal bar ke baad ya do saal ke baad dobar aata hai when they have some problems, not for follow-up. So you can understand how the uh, uh, compliance is for testing. So Indian health cost to treat diabetes reached over 73k crores in 2017. So this must have multiplied by now. So poor testing compliance leads to uh, increases prevalence of complications in type 2 diabetes and with the compliance with guidelines the target is also poor only 26.7 percent of the patients diagnosed with diabetes meet the targets of glycemic blood pressure or cholesterol con control. I have heard this in uh, last three or four lectures one by Dr. Bansi Sabu in the morning later by uh, Dr. Parik in the other hall. So everyone is actually trying to quote upon that. But the important thing is the data which we are talking about today, how many of us are actually doing HbA1c uh, in, uh, for our patients? You know the data is only 2 to 4 percent of the people are having POCTs in their clinic. Can you believe this is the data today? So we need almost 70 to 80 percent of the patient uh, clinics to have POCT devices. And when they don't have a POCT device or a regular checkup centers, the patients don't undergo HbA1c testing. Sir, next time I will get the report. When is the next time you are prescribing medicines to this particular gentleman without doing an HbA1c, without knowing their status of HbA1c? So this is the real world challenge. The moment you have a point of care testing, the whole scenario completely changes in front of the patient, like we have the example in front of you. So role of point, care, uh, point of care testing in diabetes, uh, if a patient comes to your clinic, you can do all these simple tests in 10 to 15 minutes time and your report is in front of you. The patient feels very good. A patient is working in a bank, he takes a chutti for 30 minutes and one hour time, he comes to your clinic, he gets everything done and goes with a prescription. He feels very, very satisfied. The moment you tell him, come tomorrow morning fasting and we'll take your sample of fasting for lipids and fasting blood sugar and everything. Sir, kal fir chutti lena padega kya? Then you will ask him, come in the evening for your reports and another consultation in the evening and two hours later for your post pandel Doesn't help today, you know. The compliance becomes very, very poor. And I tell you, this is what is needed today in chronic care. Services providers and technology should go hand in hand. And that is how patient's compliance and adherence is going to help. Because the next time follow-up, the patients, you know, you heard now in the last lecture, 
पेशेंट्स आते नहीं फिफ्टी परसेंट पेशेंट क्लिनिक में फॉलोअप नहीं करते वाई बिकॉज ऑफ दिस कम्बोसम नेचर ऑफ फॉलोअप पेशेंट है अरे डॉक्टर के क्लिनिक में जाएंगे ना फिर वहां दो दिन तीन दिन का छुट्टी लेना पड़ेगा यू अंडरस्टैंड सो दैट टाइप ऑफ मेंटेलिटी शुड नॉट इम्बाइव इन द पेशेंट्स माइंड डॉक्टर के क्लिनिक में जाएंगे ना एक घंटे में सारा काम हो जाएगा दैट कम्फर्ट शुड बी देयर इन देयर माइंड सो दैट दे है गुड फॉलोअप Opportunities for POCT in diabetes clinic is also very important. You can do a routine blood glucose self testing. I remember when we started uh, doing uh, using glucometers in our clinic. I'm talking about 20 years down the line. People used to say uh, these are not very very reliable. Go to the laboratory and get it done. But when you used to pick up hypoglycemia and correct it immediately, then they used to accept that the particular device is good. So that is how the opportunistic people are in it. The moment you say the blood sugar is 500. This is not a good device. Go to a, to a laboratory. The moment you say you have a good reading, ah, everything is fine. Similarly, with uh, today we do a, a ambulatory glucose monitoring. You get the data is good. It's the device is good. You don't need to get it, uh, good data. The device becomes bad. Yes, blood glucose is done by capillary method, precision, accuracy, and user acceptance. Uh, we have Dr. Amit here to talk on this a uh, little later. Structured SMBG. Precision is there uh, uh, in repeatedly. Uh, there is a data from uh, One Touch which says that the variation is very very less in the lower values. The uh, CB is less than five percent and the standard deviation of less than five milligram per deciliter. And in the clinical accuracy study, hundred percent of measurements were less with less than seventy five were bet between plus minus fifteen milligram. So it's almost as good as the laboratory data. And 99.6% of measurements with more than 75 and less than 200 were within plus minus 20%. So it's very very accurate today. And the select simple BGMS met all criteria for precision system and user accuracy was easy to use and was well accepted by the patients. And we all know the advantages of SMBG. I'm not going to talk much on that, but uh, uh, it improves the blood glucose control. It has become a one. Uh, part of almost all the patients on insulin therapy in pregnant ladies in type 1 diabetics be because less time is lost between recognizing symptoms and confirming blood glucose levels 5 seconds patient gains in independence in diabetes management and helps patient to learn and understand decision making process similarly urine testing is very very simple we don't do much today but uh, we do a uh, Uh, use a keto diastics i always ask my patients to use a keto diastics who have a poorly controlled diabetes to look for ketone bodies especially in type 1 diabetes and the limitations and the uses are it is significant in diabetes mellitus and renal glycosuria but today patients are getting drugs like zl2 inhibitors where you can have falsely positive uh, urine glucose with normal blood glucose values limitations are interference reducing agents especially vitamin c today in uh, covid time you no know, every patient is taking two to three three tablets of vitamin c ascorbic acid 500 mg immune boost, uh, booster drugs and that is how you get falsely positive urine sugars as well poc hba1c is very very popular today i am sure most of us are using it very very comfortably very easy to use the uh, you take a sample you examine a patient you do everything by the time everything is been done uh, your uh, reports are ready in front of you ready to use reagent cartridges that can be inserted straight into the analyzer blood samples are added uh, directly no need for pre mixing or pipetting minimizing the number of steps in the procedures uh, procedure reduces user error and standardized results by eliminating any variation introduced by different operators we usually use this boronate fluorescence quenching technology in uh, athenion ll uh, meters which we use commonly in our clinics and it takes 3 uh, minutes is the assay time 1.5 microliter is a sample volume you can understand very little blood is been needed whole blood samples are used configurable measuring units measuring uh, range is 4 to 15 hba1c if you have hba1c more than 15 it's like high like your glucometer provide more than 15% but the good part of this meter is if your hemoglobin is less or your hemoglobin is high it detects it and tells you that your hemoglobin is less so it doesn't give you an hba1c value the you can send the patient for anemia check and you get the uh, report immediately similarly for higher hba1c uh, higher hemoglobin values like more than 15 or 16 it picks up and says you have a higher hemoglobin values this is how it looks like the affinion to the newer one and the good thing is 
it actually takes care of not only HbA1c, albumin creatinine ratio, the lipid panel, the CRP panel. Recently, they are going to come up with the anti-pro BNP panel as well. EOCT leads to better HbA1c reduction compared to lab, both in long term and short term. And we are experiencing in clinics as well. Patient just comes to get their HbA1c done in clinics and they just move on that the HbA1c is good. They enter the clinic, get their blood tested and move on. So that is the type of advantage we have with this uh, uh, point of care uh, centers. And use of POC testing for A1C provides the opportunity for more timely treatment changes. Today, you know, the ADA suggests that if a patient is having a good control of diabetes, at least two to three HbA1C should be done, two uh, minimum HbA1C should be done. And if a patient is having a poorly control of diabetes, every three months he should undergo a HbA1C till his uh, levels targets are been achieved. So that is the type of recommendation which is coming up. Similarly, for microalbuminuria, we have a POCT device, the same device, we have a different cartridges we can use for microalbumin. We have a test strips as well which are available. This, uh, this we used to do when we were doing post-carriation in our hospital. We had these strips in our uh, uh, ward and we used to routinely follow this. Similarly, we have from Siemens the Clinitec, uh, Clinitec microalbumin reagent strips. So the important thing is, the ACR test strip showed high sensitivity, specificity, and negative predictive values, suggesting that the test can be used to screen for albuminuria in cases of pre-diabetes and diabetes. You get an idea in front of you. You can uh, immediately tell your patients to take care of it. You can repeat it after three months. At the, uh, even the ADA says you should have two microalbumin positive in six months time to actually say that this patient has got uh, nephropathy. And you should rule out UTI. One or two minutes, yeah. Similarly, for lipid panels, we use these meters uh, like uh, point of care devices. The Qualistec LDX is the one which we are using it. And it comes as a very handy device. And the lipid profile can not only be just a lipid profile, you actually get all these readings incorporated. And finally, you get a CSD risk calculated in percentage of algorithm by Framingham Heart Study. So this is another advantage with this. Similarly, we do a ketone test. The urine uh, dipstick test is very, very popular. We commonly use this. The ketone body's detection is also has limitations, like the uh, significance is like diabetes, ketoacidosis, prolonged fasting, and even patients on SGLE2 inhibitors can have ketones positive. Euglycemic uh, ketoacidosis is known with SGLE2 inhibitors. The limitations, as we discussed, are interference. We have a device to look for even blood ketone bodies, which is uh, not uh, commonly used. Uh, only when you are using this meter, you can use this device. What to expect with ketone meters? The sensitivity is again very, very good. The accurate results in 10 seconds. And people, on we have to be cautious in people who are on low carb diets and uh, experts have not reached on agreement as to what high is too high. So these are the benefits obtained by utilizing POCTs, operational benefits, clinical benefits, economic and patients benefit as well. And POCT improves patients and healthcare providers' communication and collaboration in diabetes management. They understand right in front of you. The important thing is it's a very transparent system. Patient sees in front of them that uh, the, uh, their blood has been utilized and the report is in front of them. That's the most important thing. In the bigger laboratories, they feel sometimes their sample got mismatched and uh, it's not possible. My fasting was 110, my PP was 180, how can the HbA1c be 9 and 10? So again, that is an advantage with POCT. There are some issues uh, with POCTs, the training has to be good. So, so to summarize this, simple and accurate POCT can help overcome barriers and reduce compliance with testing frequency. And this has become a holistic approach to diabetes care in many countries and many healthcare organizations. POCT can improve patient satisfaction, foster a stronger patient provider relationship, and motivate patients to be more involved with self-care. Implementation of POC testing also helps to elevate the burden of diabetes on providers by streamlining operations and creating efficiencies within the practice. Accuracy and precision of test is uh, still a challenge, hence utility of POC as diagnostic purpose needs further validation like for glucometers. We say no, you can screen a, a non-diabetic person with a glucometer, but when you have in doubt, ask them to go to a laboratory and do an OGTT or a 75 grams glucose tolerance test to actually pick up for diagnosis of diabetes. Similarly, with HbA1c in POCT, if you have a, someone with a HbA1c of 9 or 10, you need not even confirm it. But someone having a HbA1c of 6.6 .6 and 6.7, you 
you can get a second test by HPLC method, which is the gold standard to confirm it. So that is the type of validation you need. But improved clinical outcomes increases the recognition that testing plays an important role in the management of diabetes and related complications. So I thank each and everyone for their patient listening, and I thank the organizers for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for this uh, informative uh, lecture. And uh, let's proceed to the uh, second uh, lecture. We've already introduced Dr. Mahmud, so we'll start with your presentation, sir. Very, very good evening, all. Uh, th thanks for the uh, opportunity to, for, thanks to the organizer for getting me an opportunity to, to share the insights of the latest uh, technology which we had uh, invented. Would love to talk about reversal and remission of chronic, chronic diseases. And uh, to start with, let us look at the data. So this is the uh, real data from our uh, one-year randomized control trial, which has been run for the past 18 years, uh, 18 months. And our percentage reversal at D3 a360 is 94.1 percentage. And based on the recent consensus statement by the uh, ADA and other authorities, where we more talk about remission, where six months intervention and three months no medication, including metformin, our reversal rate stands at 79.8. Mind blogging uh, results, isn't it? So uh, how is it possible and what made it possible, right? And it is all. We all know that the entire community, doctor community, you had been living and breathing with uh, uh, knowing that diabetes by itself is not a disease, it's a condition. And the main problem is the disruptive metabolism. We did not have a mechanism to precisely measure because of its complex nature and the dynamic nature of it. It keeps changing often, right? Every minute it continues to be changing. And we did not have a way to precisely measure it. That is where Twin started to work on it. Because the, the other founder had a experience solving for an automobile. Tesla was powered through a technology where through the concepts of digital twin, they were able to diagnose the automobiles. The entire automobile community was powered by an IoT platform called Jasper. Based on that initiative, we had come out to the novel technology where twin comes out to with a solution where we want to retrack and ensure that we take the body back to a normal state. Wherein we are working towards a condition where members start to get back Reverses condition. That's where we had worked. There. How is it possible? We all know metabolism is also so messy. Though, though if we say it's a simplified view, it is, it is even messier than this, right? And we are trying to create a whole body digital tune of a human. With advent in technology, a lot of sensors which are coming up uh, uh, with, with artificial intelligence, machine learning into uh, existence, we are trying to put basic sensor on human body, collects data, the ML requests three or four data points and continuous correlation of it can make a digital trend. So what we do is we typically put three to five sensors depending on the body's condition. We do every quarterly blood test. Comprehensive blood test starting from CBC to testosterone of a human is collected. The lipid profile, the uh, uh, renal profile, all the blood tests are collected uh, quarterly. And in addition, addition, we collect causal data from the human. We ask the member to log in their mood, energy, what they eat, uh, what they like, dislike, all those are collected. And by every day, 3,000 data points are collected through the sensor data. And it correlates across all these data points. There's a computation of 1.4 into 10 to the power of 104 computations. Just imagine 1.4 followed by 104 zeros of such a huge computation takes place by which it tries to create a pattern and tries to come out with the innovative solution of creating a mimic of a human body. So the innovation here is 
we had come out with the whole body digital twin which is able to able to offer up and understand the root cause of the problem which is nothing but the damaged metabolism and it is highly individualized because we all know every human is unique and the way each human behaves is completely unique and with the advent of technology the world is moving towards offering precision treatment so the here the whole body digital twin the innovation is to make doctors super powerful to make doctors offer precision treatment to make off to see doctors offer a better solution holistically and it is dynamic completely and accountable that's very very important because ultimately doctor wants solution which are accountable which is proven right and the solution that we offer should be sustainable it is not just someone reverse today and it goes off right it needs to sustain that's very very important that's what it is and when we spoke to doctors we asked doctors after we uh, rolled out the technology in india we asked uh, a doctor doctor your patient has reversed how happy are you what will make you even happier he said the first thing that i want is i want my member to be happy the health comes next i want my patient to be happy and that is where we started to use technology to ensure that we make the coexistence of happiness and health and that is what the technology has made it possible it is nothing but through atomic experience smaller experience can we offer through micro actions and micro feelings what is need to be done that's what is the power of technology because we keep the changing we're telling behavioral change is challenging it's not so easy so here what we are trying to do is we are trying to we have built this technology to ensure that through atomic experience through micro experience can we offer the outcome and that is what has made it possible through simple repeatable action but it is dynamic real time insights member is able to see the real time insight of what is happening in the body that's more powerful so we all know how are you doing you may say i am doing great but can you precisely tell how good are you doing with data points with health data points someone will be healthier but all of a sudden that night he collapses but here technology makes it possible that he knows where his body is he knows what is his condition what how did, how well is his kidney functionality is that is the power of technology which is making it possible and as i tell told you whatever outcome we deliver it should be sustainable that's what doctor loves to be right so look at right and that's what we try to offer it is we start with engagement on board the patient with doctor and a care team the care team encompasses the primary doctor a junior doctor alternate and a coach for every patient and he starts it's a journey it's not it is not an instantaneous action it is a it is journey with and he tries to get an healthy for life solution so how is it possible and what was the technology behind it so as i told you set of sensor data lab uh, diagnostic data and the causal data we try to build a whole body digital twin first of its kind it's a patented solution and in addition to that the treatment what are the treatment factors that make it possible it is precision nutrition precision medication precision activity precision sleep and meditative breathing this is what makes it possible and almost 70% of our patients are able to stop their medication in less than 60 days of time that's something which is which is very very amazing that we are able to see and we have proved that it is free not epic independent because the solution is precision to the individual's body's condition so it may take a longer time for some body but for most of them it tries to offer the solution when i talk about precision nutrition you may be wondering is it yet another dietary program that this company is trying to offer of course no it's not a dietary program it's a healing program someone cannot follow a diet for life it's practically not possible so ultimately as the member is offered a solution dr dr shanmavel was talking about the importance of biotam the importance of the dietary program and other stuff at the end of it when doctor asked is there data to be understood about what is it and we all know there are multiple factors which are there deficient of this is also bad excess is also bad it is toxic on either ends so positioning depending on the metabolic condition of the body is very very important it is not that rice is bad for all it is not that wheat is bad for all it is personalized to individual depending on the metabolic condition of the body which is very very important when precisely when you offer the solution through factoring the 87 factors that are available in the food that we eat because most of the dietary program looks at the macronutrients in a big way but the macronutrients are only a source of fuel to the body and the actual energizing factor are the micronutrients and the biota 
and through the high definition database which we had built we had built for more than a million food items capturing all the 87 factors which has made it possible today so through precision nutrition and activity people say you would go do walking you and people are there to say that you lose weight you normalize sugar it's not so you normalize today but tomorrow what is it right you need to sustain it that's very very important fatiguing the muscle precisely to improve the insulin resistance is very very important so understanding the body the whole body digital twin precisely recommend what kind of metabolic uh, muscle metabolism has to be done what kind of movement has to be done to improve the insulin resistance and sleep something very very important in order to regulate the sl uh, sleep of the hormonal impact which is very very important so sleep recommendation is very very important precisely understanding the body's condition which by which we are able to retrack it so for everything there is an engine built so this is the aml model which we had built this is a patented solution and this is what has made it possible what i am talking about right and we are literally trying to understand map with the timeline how does the body moves because metabolism keeps changing so we capture the entire factors under timeline and try to factorize it and offer a solution which is making it possible and how easy it is or how difficult it is so the initial stage of the uh, uh, treatment what is required is the member needs to spend 6 minutes in this app maximum 6 minutes is what is required and as the whole body digital twin matures when it starts when he gets into the platform he tries to find out his peer almost the same though it is not the same across the twin uh, millions of twins which are created across the globe and offers a generic solution but as it matures it starts to mature medications goes off sensors gets reduced that's the novelty of what we are trying to do the whole body digital twin has the capability to predict sugars the whole body digital twin has the capability to predict hypertension the whole body digital twin tracks the kidney functionality and all these at an accuracy of 97 percentage after 35 days of time cgm patch is not used people think that with cgm patch they will be able to reverse diabetes it is not so we are not looking at sugars as a, sugars are one of the factors into the digital twin our focus is to go heal the root cause of the problem which is the disruptive metabolism right people look at sugar in a big way sugar say simple example if you want you could try it out put a cgm patch eat the same food same time daily do you think the sugar response is the same hundred percent no and the difference is huge right but people think that that is the solution but that's where we tell don't look at sugars sugars is a by product what we need to look at it is we need to look at the body holistically and that is where we are able to eliminate things and as the digital twin becomes matured even the food log is not required the member has to wear the watch and use the body composition monitor daily morning that's it by which the, the digital twin starts to understand and start to offer a right solution and this is the deep learning of what is making it possible how the learning happens is what i am trying to depict, uh, depict here sure so and this is what uh, is very very interesting you could see here we had picked up 50 patients and we have picked up picked up around eight parameters eight factors at a, at a time look at how the body behaves some body wants more of uh, sodium some body wants more of activity some body want more of sleep and the beauty is this keeps changing that's what is very very important and dynamism makes it complex and that's what is making it very very powerful right and this is what i told you the way every body metabolizes is totally different you could see here right we had lensed it and shown so uh, across 50 members every food items is captured as dot when it is green the body is able to metabolize when it is red it is not able to metabolize but the beauty of our treatment is when the member gets into the platform you could see here when the initial stage most of the food items are red intolerant as he has yielded his metabolism, the food starts to become green. The digital twin understands on the day of enrollment, the food are, in, are intolerant. And as he heals the metabolism, the platform starts to recommend the food which was said now red in the early stages. Because he has healed his metabolism. By which he goes back and starts to eat his normal food. That is what is making the power of, what is it, true, right? So how does each body behave is what we are trying to show here. Already she has told two minutes, so let me wind it up. 
and netflix and is one of the biggest player on the prediction you look at the comparison already our prediction model has overtaken what netflix has, uh, netflix is able to do right that is the power of technology so these are some uh, you data points to show you and uh, let me quickly run through things this is what i told this is the actual data of a cgm patch this is the actual data of a cgm patch and the pink line depicts the prediction of the whole body digital twin after the cgm the digital twin has learned the body it starts to predict the sugars right and by which you eliminate the requirement of the cgm patch and you look at how does the uh, glucose and look at what google's prediction is and where twin prediction is far 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 superior to the prediction model what we had built right and this is what is hypertension prediction right and uh, retina prediction comparison all these are proven scientifically and published as data and as i told you this is the kidney functionality we track the kidney functionality too and how what do we do we really build a network of twin every twin every body understands each other and talks to each other to make ourselves better and the solution is offered by which we are able to precisely and these are the patterns that we had occurred occurred, uh, occurred so far and uh, very proud to share that though we have a embargo but this forum i don't mind sharing three of our papers that we had submitted three papers to ada all three papers are got uh, uh, accepted in ada invited for presentation and adding to it is adding to it is they had identified our technology to be unique and revolutionary which is going to make a huge difference in the mankind and ada has requested us permission for doing a media press coverage and already we had given uh, 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 acceptance for it so you will start to see ada talking about whole body digital twin before ada initiative was started and all these are scientifically published all claims are scientifically published and as i said though this is a diabetic conference i spoken about remission and reversal we see gamut of change happening in the body we are able to reverse hypertension we are able to dis uh, reverse uh, dyslipidemia we are able to reverse multiple things so these are things which are there and based on what we had learned we had initiated rct on hypertension and nafld and uh, uh, and uh, you could see these are the data which we are seen regulated after a year of uh, uh, the whole body digital twin intervention with patients so thanks for the opportunity to present uh, uh, the technology to this forum thank you it was really really interesting to look at how twin health is actually working so with that we leave the rest of the questions for the discussion part and we have our very own dr banshi sabu sir sir needs no introduction he is my mentor and i would like to really say that he has a lot of feathers in his hat starting from being the current secretary for diabetes india and then i'll say he's the president for immediate past president for rssdi i can't name an organization where he's not in one of the elite uh, panel and okay to be he's a clinician an academician a scientist a researcher and i think i'm i'm out of out of words or i'm out of adjectives so over to you sir So what I am going to talk on a connected blood glucose monitoring from evidence to clinical practice. Before I make my presentation, I just want to make that this is the technology workshop which we are doing. And before it also there was one more one hour technology on continuous glucose monitoring which we have done. And what we found that a technology usage in our country is really less. And I am sure uh, those who are practicing diabetes and they are we many of us are using technology in a different format in our country but still the uses of technology at a primary care or even at a consultant level is still very less and what should we do in a future i think we should have more and more uses of technology uh, 
to improve the care for diabetic patients. That is what our vision is. And with that vision, we have started a diabetes technology, a dedicated meeting only on technology. That's what we have started. It is a definitely a technology is a part of all big meetings, whether it's a diabetes India, RSSDI, or uh, across the country in last decade, you go and see any meeting, you will find one hour, two hour. But what I had seen that technology workshop is in workshop room. It is not in the part of main hall, not in the part of the main program, and that's what we had seen. And still those who are coming in the technology workshop, they already use the technology. So it should be used by more physicians with more doctors, and that's the reason we had thought of to start a dedicated meeting on a diabetes technology. Shashank have come the, uh, for the twin technology, you know. Just one look, I know, I know you have come for him only. I know, but unluckily, I am the speaker now. He had already finished his talk. <laughs> So we have now dedicated meeting also on diabetes technology. So the next time it will not be in the workshop, Muluk. You are there already in our dedicated meeting of diabetes technology, which was there for two days. Amit, uh, Shashang was the advisor, and many of you, even Mithun and everyone was the part of it. I'll be finishing in next 15 minutes on a talk on a connected blood glucose monitoring from evidence to clinical practice. I have a disclaimer to make here that it's a supported by LifeScan. So I'll be using their slides also for that. The current challenges in diabetes care is worsening patients to provide a ratio that we know that number of healthcare professionals to take care of diabetic patients are less. In our country, there are geographical barriers to assess the care. That's also very important because the rural part of our country is still not able to get the best of the doctors. The patient burden is very, very high. The provider burden is here high because they have to see a lot of patients. I mean, those who are practicing dedicated practice, they have to see a lot of patients. There is an economic burden also, it's a huge economic burden for the patients and no improvement in outcome because still the average A1C of our country is more than 8 or 8.5 and still we have highest number of complications with diabetes in our country. So I mean, there is no improvement as far as outcome is concerned for our country. We all see the ADA guideline, but we forget to see the right part of that tabular format that is a patient-centered approach, which they have put in the tabular form, that it is the, uh, not the ADA guideline does not mean only the therapy guideline. It is the patient-centered approach that is most important part of it. If you see the complete booklet, they talk about the goals of care. The goal of care is to prevent the complication. Why we are treating the diabetic patients? for prevention of the complications. And second most important thing, to optimize the quality of life. These are the two most important things. You are treating diabetic patients not for anything, for preventing the complication and for better quality of life. So whenever a patient is there, we have to assess the patient. We have to plan the treatment, whatever we are deciding. The management plan has to go upon it. We have to agree with the patients, which is not there in our country. We just write it. It has to be implemented. But the most important thing is the monitoring of the plan. And I think where we are lacking. We write the patient treatment, but we don't monitor it, either neither by the doctor nor by the patients. Patient come after two years, one year, six years, five years with the A1C of 9, 8.5. In between, they might have checked up their A1C. They might have done their even sugar report also, but it is always high, and they have not done any monitoring. So I think the monitoring is something which is completely lacking in our country, and it is one of the important and responsible reasons for us to have a uncontrolled diabetes in our country. The blood glucose monitoring is a fundamental component of a diabetes care. We educate the patient, we do assessment, we optimize the therapy, but ultimate outcome of the patient is not able to achieve a good glycemic control because patients are not monitored frequently. And this is a real fact. Even after 20 years of self-monitoring of blood glucose in our country, we ask our patient to buy the glucose meter. They do it very occasionally, not very regular basis. They have the glucose meter. They have the strips. They, even some of the patients do even A1C also, but they don't go to the doctor to show that report also. Probably we are not educating them enough for monitoring part of it. The self-monitoring of blood glucose, HB1C is perceived as a gold standard for monitoring glycemic control and serves as a surrogate for diabetes-related complication. All the data which we have. We know that now we started using the time in range, but it's only for those patients where you are using continuous glucose monitoring. You can't
can't think of for each and every patient. And that's what the new term for patients who are using self-monitoring of blood glucose. You can think of points in range, if not times in range for that patient. It does not provide information about day-to-day -day and intraday changes in glucose level. I'm sure we all know that the HP1C is going to give you the only average glucose level. It is not going to tell you, nothing going to tell you about intraday or intraday changes in the glucose level. Self-monitoring is important because it can distinguish fasting, preprandial, postprandial, detect glycemic excursion, identify and assist monitoring resolution in hypoglycemia, and provide immediate feedback to patients about the effect of food choice, activity, medication on glycemic control. And somebody may argue, these all you can better do with a continuous glucose monitoring. I agree with that. You can do all these things with a CGM, but it's still those you can't have, and we know that everyone can't have the CGM. Still, CGM is not recommended by AS and ADA. For type 1, they are recommending, not for every type 2 diabetic patients, probably uh, less data is available, the evidence is less, and we want to have more of patients on a self-monitoring of blood glucose which have more data in compared to and which have uh, also other advantages of distinguishing these patients and to get uh, the data of fasting, preprandial, and post meal also. Now, what is most difficult thing? I think the patient does not come with a meaningful monitoring. The structure monitoring is not there. Many of these patients, they come with a rough pad and they just write 10, 12, 15 reports, occasionally done, randomly done, not doing the sugar monitoring as per prescribe. And a busy clinician, he does not want to see even that Ganda paper, you know, which is written with hundreds of reports is written on that. And he does not want to see, he does not want to spend even few minutes for that. And this demotivates the patient. I mean, if your patient had shown, because he has done multiple times the sugar report, he had pricked it and he tries to show to the clinician, see, I have done 100 times the sugar, my, this was this and then, okay, it's fine. So he just tried to see the HP1C and he just tried to medication on that. So this demotivates the patient. And this is also one of the reasons why our patients are not doing self-monitoring of blood glucose very regularly. So we have to make our SMBG very, very structured. We have to make it very, very meaningful. And that's very important because that is going to modify their behavior. If we write everything in a very proper way, that how many preprandials, post meals, random, midnight, and everything is written in a proper way, or you make a, a, a graphical presentation of that, or either by some way or other way. And for that, I am going to talk that what exactly the meaningful monitoring or what the structure monitoring is there. The structure intervention will definitely have a, a better outcome. This is what we do in our clinical practice. I mean, in my uh, you know, clinic, when we give the paper uh, like this, you can do because each and every patient is not doing actually seven times a day. I mean, even a type 1 diabetic patients also, we call them three times a day you do before meals and then you check your sugar and take your insulin accordingly. Once in a week, you can do seven times a day. Sometime weekend, sometime weekdays, that is what we try to do. And we, we get a structured intervention because this will show you that where the sugar reports are up or low. But ideally, these patients should be also empowered because if there is a high or there is a low, they should also, uh, you know, uh, try to do on their own because that is also what we should do. It's just not just seeing the reports. If they have a 56, then what they have done? You have to empower the patient to do all those things too. The pattern analysis will give you the idea that where the patient sugar is getting high or low. And that will very important because that will decide your diet, that will decide the exercise, the pattern, everything, all the aspects of the uh, a diabetes care which can be done because the structural intervention will definitely help for these patients. These are the protocol. This is that acting based on the patient is the change is necessary and the responding to pattern. So whatever the patient had done, suppose in this week he had seen whatever the changes which was there in the post meal and he has changed his diet accordingly. The next week he can see on his own also that these things are really making difference in his life. And that is what uh, whatever the action which he takes, the patterns will change also. Now how connected blood glucose monitoring is a tool for remote monitoring. This is what the point is that, you know, the self-monitoring of blood glucose over a period of time, it also evolved. We know that simultaneously a technology of continuous glucose monitoring had come, but the blood glucose monitoring also evolved in last 20 or 30 years. Still that it had come with a very small amount of the blood now you can have. Very uh, prick is also almost penless. You get very small amount of the blood and still you can get connected. The glucose meter now connected with your device. It is also been remotely monitored even not only by your uh, doctor, but also remotely monitored by your, I mean, the relative and uh, 
uh, even the friends also if you want to remotely somebody wants to monitor you uh, that what's your sugar level also so this is how the new generation connected blood glucose monitoring devices work the patient monitor their blood glucose on a bluetooth connected one touch vero flex meter i am just here again i told you this is the life scan so i am using their slide to talk that this is their brand but there are many other glucose meter which are also connected so i mean they can be connected with your smartphone and the blood glucose data get automatically transferred uh, once they get synchronized on a mobile app it is also in a graphical form so your doctor can also get the complete on a web page that how the uh, data looks like in between contact with the scp patient continues to monitor their glucose value using their meter and may gain further insight using this mobile application which are again available with different glucose meter system and healthcare professional can access the patient data remotely between the visits on one touch reveal web app that can connect the patient if needed and again i am telling with other glucose meter also this type of web application is available so it's not necessarily that only with one company it is there so my point is here this connected glucose meter how they can help the patients and healthcare professional as well as their relative also it reveal the complete ecosystem now we know that at least one part of it is very important because it also gives you some patient is doing multiple times monitoring it gives you the graphical presentation and that looks very you know for the healthcare professional once you see that report like what we see in ambulatory glucose profile you know when we, we were doing before abbot libre had come i mean the metronic was there with a the continuous glucose monitoring but you know it was very confusing and that was also one of the reason that cgm was never interpreted and uh, the metronic continuous glucose monitoring nobody was using and once the ambulatory glucose profile in this format it had come we all started using it because it becomes very easy and the similarly uh, you can see a similar type of graphical presentation when patient is uh, using a connected glucose meter and it actually reveal the complete ecosystem and for a healthcare professional it becomes very easy that where the patient going sugar above or low it gives you like graph like a time in range we may call it points in range because it's not continuous monitoring how many times the patient have done suppose in a week time if it is done more than 20 times you can find that out of 20 um uh, like if the different times of the day 15 is done it is like 75% of the time it is points in range so i mean that is what it is done oh sorry so one touch reveal patient app this is it, it looks like this application i am not going in a detail because uh, you can see also this is the uh, how the different multiple times the patient is monitored these uh, it will come in this graphical form which becomes also very easy for the patient and he can also write the event event is very important because whether it is pre meal post meal pre exercise post exercise for doctor to understand it's very important uh, he can share the report and that sharing the report will also give the The green and red and the blue. I mean, that's color coding is there. That how much time the person's sugar was in the control. Also, if the web app uh, for the doctors also becomes very easy because he can see how many times the patient have done the sugar and how many times the patient sugar remains in the application. I mean, in the uh, uh, in the time and range will ensure a meaningful diabetes. Care because that is what more important. Just to get monitoring is not sufficient. it is the meaningful monitoring now here i want to put two word the structure monitoring mean how structurally you are doing and uh, the companies have made job much easier because by getting the app and by getting the web page you can see this structure monitoring more but meaningful monitoring mean the doc patient who is doing the sugar report he should also understand what is the report meaning i mean if it is 164 it is 254 or it is 64 he should also understand that this is 54 what he has to do so the action plan we have to give the patient that is what the empowerment of a patient is very very important and that is what the meaningful monitoring for this this is one of the uh, data which is randomized control trial with 5 uk sites 121 patients with type 1 diabetic patients i am not going in the detail of methodology i am just putting the data to show that key outcome of the study with 1% decrease in the a1c and 10.4% increase in the number of blood glucose value so if you give the structure monitoring and meaningful monitoring even patient also get motivated to do more and more monitoring and to get that in a clinical setting in a case study where a 65 year old female lives alone uh, post hospitalization patient was put on a uh, 
basal bolus insulin and patient was getting her sugar and simultaneously she was also titrating her sugar report and at the same time as she was not going to the clinic or hospital again and again and the blood glucose monitoring can be reviewed remotely from the doctor's clinic. So that's an advantage that you can use for your patients who are on uh, basal bolus and they are remotely they can be monitored if they are living alone. So this is what we can do from this to summarize my talk blood glucose monitoring is a cornerstone for the management of diabetes and help healthcare provider to assess the glycemic control adjust therapy accordingly and help patients to modify lifestyle accordingly structure monitoring pattern analysis and specific action based on pattern provides better control on both hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia patient and physician connected blood glucose monitor eases the burden with the logbook maintaining data sharing evaluating blood glucose reading and remote monitoring with this i think Thank once again. Sorry for uh, some more time. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor, for uh, giving an insightful lecture on uh, monitoring. And we move to the last uh, uh, topic for today uh, by Dr. Amit Gupta. Uh, he is uh, a director for Center for Diabetes Care from Greater Noida. Uh, he's an Apex body member of the Art of Living Trust, a reviewer for multiple magazines. So uh, almost 70% uh, of my talk has already been covered by Bansi Sabu, sir. So I am left with only two, three points which I would like to drive home. No, no, sir. You have made my task easy. <laughs> so I will particularly focus on point in range and how we can make SMBG data more structured and helpful. Because uh, when we were searching for point in range publications, we couldn't find many. And this was uh, this again shows that this is uh, this is an area where a lot of research can be done, and we can actually publish a lot of data. And this is something which we do regularly with our patients. So uh, structured cell monitoring of the blood glucose, sir has already talked about, and uh, we will talk about the point in range. I think slides. So uh, I will not go into the details uh, of what uh, SMBG is and what how, how and how does it helps. Uh, we all know that uh, one of the problem which we have identified is that there is uh, trouble in spotting the pattern. So whether it is a CGM, uh, whether it was a uh, earlier Medtronic devices or the newer uh, CGM devices, whether it is the diary of the patient, the logbook, or for, or the data even which is captured in the apps. So there is always a trouble, and most of the time, as uh, rightly pointed out by, uh, by Bansi sir, we don't take, uh, we don't pay too much attention to the data. And uh, this is also discouraging for the patient. So what can be done? Is there any way to uh, uh, look into this? So why don't clinicians utilize SMBG data? There is a insufficient information. Sometimes the patient does not bring the data in the way you would like to see. So you have ordered something, you have requested something, but the patient uh, uh, is often checking something else. Uh, we don't, uh, we are, uh, we don't, we are not able to educate and train the uh, person. Many a times it happens that you have given a glucometer, and after three months, the patient will simply tell. Uh, even after buying the glucometer, patient has not tested because uh, he uh, simply couldn't uh, deal with the glucometer or handle the glucometer wisely. So many a times the glucometer is there, the, but the person is not using. Also, sometimes we overestimate ourselves that we have given the treatment, the patient will be fine. So <laughs> there is no need for monitoring and the patient will, the next time the patient will come, it will be okay. Uh, difficult to analyze the data, poor time uh, which uh, we devote to our patients. And there is also, sometimes there is a fear of adverse events like hypoglycemia if patient monitors too frequently and the patient gets very uh, <laughs> variable sugars, then the, other, the patient will reach out to you, whether it is a hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. So a patient who monitors more frequently is likely to reach out to you uh, more, more and more. So at times you may feel that it is again a trouble for you. Uh, because you may not like to respond all the time to the fluctuating sugar levels. So again, uh, uh, this is something. So there is a vicious uh, cycle. We know that there is a la lack of patient SMBG performance. There is unrealized SMBG value and there is lack of clinician SMBG utilization. So what is structured SMBG? A structured SMBG is something that uh, monitoring blood glucose at the right frequency, at the right times, and in the right situations. So uh, if we look at this, uh, what are the benefits of the structured SMBG? For the patients, the structured testing means that it improves disease awareness. It also improves the ability to recognize and estimate impact of certain behaviors and active participation in the therapy adjustments. For, the, for us, what does it mean is that we get more reliable data 
and we are able to analyze the patterns and we can adjust the drugs and the therapies. Also, there is a better compliance and more active involvement of the patient in the care. So the patient becomes a partner in the care rather than uh, just the receiver of the care. So this is just a flow showing that when we ask the patient to do a structured testing, then we analyze the pattern, then the treatment decision is taken and the treatment decision is then implemented in, in the form of action and then we see what happens to the patient. So uh, prior to the uh, 2001 step publications, it, there was a growing body of evidence which was beginning to demonstrate the beneficial effect of structured blood glucose testing and I will not go into details, there are many publications which are there and clinical studies on the structured SMBG. So uh, uh, this is uh, one of the study, uh, slide which shows that uh, this is uh, in which the structured SMBG pattern was uh, was done and what happens is that when you do it in a structured way, it was seen that it actually improves the patient's HbA1c and the other parameters also improve. Uh, like uh, when uh, Dr. Maluk was talking, he was getting thousands of data uh, at a particular point of day or a particular point of time and then they are interpreting it, uh, interpreting it by means of AI or the deep learning or the machine learning. But here what we are doing is that we are managing our own data Many of the times the doctors also don't feel comfortable in uh, entering the data in uh, others app because of the fear of some data uh, privacy and the other policies. So it is very easy to make your own app also where you can ask the patient the data doesn't go anywhere, data remains with you and you can still get these patterns and analysis where the manual feeding can also be done even if they are not using any advanced glucometer then it is something which is very simple. Uh, so this brings to me uh, to the second part of my talk, that is the point in range, which we wanted to highlight in this. We all know that there is a time in range, type of, a time above range and time below re, uh, range and a lot of uh, talks are happening, local, a lot of symposiums are happening when it comes to CGM and all this. But there is something called PIR, that is point in range, the point above range and the point below range. And this is something which we can get very easily from the SMBG data of our patients. So uh, there is a limited evidence that the blood glucose values measured with SMBG can be pooled and expressed as TIR, TBR and TAR. So we have also seen that uh, simply few measurements, they cannot be correlated with TIR and uh, they cannot be correlated with the CGM also. So you need many data points. So PIR or uh, PAR or PBR is something that is in between TIR and the uh, SMBG alone. So it is more than SMBG and less than CGM, but it again, uh, it can again help us in getting bit, uh, better understanding of the patient's data. So uh, this is just a very uh, slight, if you look at this data carefully, this is one of the dashboard from our own patient. And if you see that this patient is regularly checking the blood sugar level, this is from the 8th gen and you can see the last measurement was on the 20, 19th of May. And you can see this is very well uh, self-recorded and uh, transferred to us through the app. And you can see that most of the time the patient's fasting glucose is less than 130. There are some points where the patient is touching, uh, going above 130, but most of the time the patient is below 140. So the, in a one glance, you can make a, a meaningful interpretation of the data. And the patient is also happy that you have seen all the data. At the same time, uh, this also gives you some sense of prediction before you order the HbA1c. You will see that this patient is likely to have a better HbA1c because you have seen so many data points in the last three, four months and the only few, only just few times the patient was above uh, 130, which is the ADA target that we target for less than 130 milligram per deciliter for the, as per the ADA recommendations. Similarly, this patient, this is the data from the same patient where you will find that the, they have recorded pre-meal glucose levels also, but less frequently, but in a more structured way. You will see if the you see, see then you will find that the patient is monitoring almost every 15th day sometime more frequently sometime less frequently but you will see that patient is below 180 only once the patient was above 180 so again it, it uh, gives you a, a snapshot that again this patient is likely to have a good control of uh, blood sugar because you have uh, seen so many data points this is the post uh, meal blood glucose of the patient and again you will find that if you look at the data from the 30th march to 21st May, you will find that most of the time the patient is below 150. So this, this is what the point in range means and the patient is doing a regular testing. So can we do some more research to bring in data that where uh, or is there any data which actually can predict the HbA1c uh, from this point of range testing. This is again a second patient, uh, the same kind of data you can see. Most of the time the patient, the fasting glucose is less than 105. The uh, pre-meal sugar, most of the time it is less than 120. There are only two points which are above 
120. This is again the post meal blood glucose levels, which are again less than 140. So this is again a very compliant patient who is regularly monitoring their blood sugar, and they are actually adding some value to their data. So this is again uh, the dashboard of the some other uh, systems uh, where uh, now we have all as Bansi sir has seen that this is from the Vario where you can see uh, the data. This is the another point. So this is important to understand that there is a significant correlation between HbA1c and the PIR, which can be calculated by the integrated digital technology. In one of the study, uh, I will not go into the details of this study, but this is important to highlight that. Uh, in the study, what the study was found, uh, found that there was a significant difference between type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes in all, all metrics except the percentage of the point above range. And this is the most important slide, uh, which tells us that the point in range of 70% measured over two months correspond to HbA1c of 7.2%. So if a person was having point, uh, was uh, in point of range for more than 70% of the times, that it was likely that the HbA1c of the patient would be somewhere around 7.2 with plus minus some variations. Again, the PIR of 70% measured over two weeks correspond to an HbA1c of 7.1%. And every shift in PIR by 10% corresponds to a change in HbA1c of around 0.4%. So this, again, uh, this kind of prediction can help us in uh, estimating the HbA1c and overall control of the patient. So this is what we wanted to highlight in this uh, talk. So thank you, thank you very much for the patients listening and uh, I was very brief in this because a lot of things have already been covered by Dr. Dandania and Dr. Maluk and Dr. Bansi sir. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you sir. So now we have two speakers from the session. Any points of discussion that uh, you know we can discuss or any highlight you want to you know, touch upon before we close the session? One thing which I would like to stress upon is when you are writing a prescription, we should also prescribe for monitoring as well, which we are not doing. I think that is very, very important part of this particular meeting. For each and every patient, we should prescribe that this should be monitored like this. Only then we are going to have things getting into the head of the patient's mind. You understand? And you should tell these patients, come with a written record. Don't write it in their mind, you know. I've been doing blood sugar regularly, but if you don't have a record of it, how does it help? It doesn't help. And when they are doing a blood sugar, tell them to do it in a structured way. That is also, that this comes to be the third one. Otherwise, kya hota hai, malume? most of the times the strip gets expired. So that is what is happening. And to all the healthcare professionals, I'm saying all the healthcare professionals looking after diabetic patients, Use point of care. I'm telling you, it's a very, very useful tool for the patients and their outcome. At least they learn monitoring from your clinic. That is one thing that they can learn in a clinic. Use a authenticated glucometers. Don't use the unauthenticated glucometers in your clinic. They may not give you much earning. They will give you less of earning because the steps are expensive, but they'll give you a good data. And patient learns from it how to do it by seeing the process of doing it. And they find it very, very easy, painless, almost painless. Tell them to prick on the lateral aspect of the digits. That is almost painless. And they see the result in five seconds. That is how they learn it. So first glucometer encounter in a clinic. Then the second encounter is your HbA1c. The third encounter is your lipids. So everything becomes so simple for them. So you need, all the doctors should at least try to install these devices in the clinic. Our own critics are our colleagues, let me tell you very, very honestly. Yes. Some of them would like to use uh, SMBG. Some would like to use CGM. Some, you may have a PO device, but still somebody would say that I would like to go for a prick and uh, send the sample to the lab. So there is a space for everything. And uh, as a uh, prof uh, practicing professionals, we should have uh, an open mind to all the technology, whatever is coming to us, what I believe.
this i would just like to share my experience i shared with dr mithun just now i was also in this psych that pocd device would be whether it will give right reading or whether it will be wrong if i do this whether the patient will accept it or not uh, let me tell you 90% of the test now of the hba1c they are happening through the pocd device in my clinic and almost 20% of the patients they bring their own health records and they will again go back and do the testing and uh, I have never found a report which does not matches to the our POCT device. Not a single report I have found. Well, this is not endorsement for anybody, but this is coming from my own personal experience. And earlier I was not using the device out of the same fear, whether the patient will accept it or not. If, what if the patient comes with a report, if there is a difference in the report, how I am going to explain that. But then now I am too confident that I can say you go and check anywhere. This is not going to be the room. And we have uh, on POCT device, one of the very beautiful paper, I think, which have been written uh, by all the stalwarts in our country. And there are guidelines of using POCT devices in our country. So we've had a wonderful session. And uh, with permission, can we close the session? Thank you. Thank you.